two of the Northampton City Council FY2014 budget hearings. This is the second one. This is Thursday, May 30th. Uh, I'm City Council President Bill White. I'll be presiding. Um, and we're working through an agenda tonight that features police department, auditor's office, fire department, planning department, central services, Smith Vocational, and Agricultural High School. Um, so stay tuned. <laughs> uh, first up, we're going to hear from the police department. Uh, the chief is here, and Captain Conkus is here as well. Gentlemen, oh, I got to do a roll call. We got to figure out who's here first. I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry. Kind of rushing things. Roll call, please. Councilor Adams. Here. Councilor Carney. Present. Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Barr. Councilor Murphy. Here. Councilor Schwartz. Here. Councilor Speck. Here. Councilor Tacey and Councilor Freeman Daniels are on their way. Budget stuff. 
speaking of the budget, that's 2013, unless anybody has any particular questions. <clears throat> yeah. Um, uh, Councilor Schwartzman, Councilor uh, Casey. I, I might have missed the comparison of domestic violence cases that, that compared to last year. Did mm -hmm. you offer that? Mm -hmm. I'm curious about that rate. <clears throat> I actually didn't compare it to last year's. I could do that really Oh, quickly. I don't need to take your time. Uh, each one of my supervisors has a different area of responsibility. <clears throat> so they annually pr provide a report for me. Uh, annual reports from the operations commander, training report, a uh, protective career report. I have a domestic violence <clears throat> statistical sheet here somewhere, I'm sure. I mean, I, I, I lightened my load by taking some of them out. It was, it was a moderate, modest increase, not a great increase. <clears throat> but I think it was my best recollection, 60 to 10 difference. It's a fairly stable number, generally. Councilor Jason. I want to make sure that what you did was speak or not, but 300 registered sex offenders in the city. It's 300 registered sex registrations. The homeless have to register every 30 days. So each of those account for 12. And then we have um, the population of the jail counts, the population of soldier yard counts. Um, and uh, again, some of the things we're working on is uh, <clears throat> well, some communities are moving to figure out how to write ordinances to create no sex offender zones everywhere, or sex offender registry person. Sergeant McMahon has been working with, uh, and I think you even know about it, uh, working with HAP and other organizations to find single room only housing that would be eligible for the sex offenders to, to get into and not violate any of the terms and conditions so they're off the street but they're in a place that doesn't put them at risk for uh, contact with whatever the rules of, uh, of contact are for their, their orders and it lets us know where they are because we do have a fair amount of people that register as under the South Street Bridge or you know down the one or three meadows or whatever so <clears throat> So we have to track them down and make sure that's their actual house. So you have pretty frequent conversations with the VA and things such as that. Soldier Army isn't really a problem because they're under, they have very strict admission rules and behavior rules up there. So if anybody, you know, some of the substance abuse up there, they stray, they're, they're out of the program. But they do have a homeless shelter up there also, which is very large. They're probably really more, absolutely. And it's, it's a wonderful project as far as I'm concerned. Very few times do they end up finding themselves downtown because they have some much activities up there. And again, Mr. Sir Groves that Jack Dowling runs up there. Okay, thank you. Um, sure. uh, actually, I'm sorry, the Councilor Carney was um, next. Just a quick question about the, um, the grant from the Department of Mental Health. Uh -huh. um, can you just talk a little bit more about that? I didn't hear if you said what that, how much that, uh, how much that was for the department. <coughs> the total amount is, I mean, we. Uh, I don't have those figures. I was trying to summarize for some of the things. Yeah, I think you say that you get four, um, you're ready to do training with this money for uh, 12 hours per officer, so that's yep. a substantial amount. Okay. It's a certification program. We were the first. It's a model for a, a recruit training now. We're trying to introduce a basic recruit academy. We've gotten 18 to 20. No, the officer, Joe's, Joe's <coughs> got the numbers, I'm sure. We've, uh, we've trained almost all of our patrol officers in what's called a mental health first aid. That's a basic uh, uh, training to deal with people that have emotional or uh, mental health issues out in the field. And then we just put uh, 12 people through uh, a more extensive training. This is a whole week training, 40 hours, of a program called... Uh, critical intervention team training. This is, uh, and the whole emphasis behind that is uh, to try to divert people that have uh, mental health or emotional problems uh, who get in trouble when they're getting in trouble is because of those issues there. And when possible, when, you know, we don't have a victim issue or whatever, divert them directly to training rather than get them back into the criminal justice system where we have the ongoing revolving door. So we get them the treatment that they need and hopefully we will interrupt that cycle and, and they'll become uh, productive 
members of our community. It's, it, you know, I don't want to speak to the budget, but all the discussion about how the police department does down, downtown, this is part of what we do behind the scenes. Because these officers are trained and respected by the uh, community support options folks, so if Chris is an intervention team, we can issue a, a, a section 12. They used to have to come out with the evaluation. Now it's a cell phone call, I've seen this, this is my diagnosis, okay, section 12 is back to the station, you call an ambulance, and the ambulance comes, you take them to the hospital, get them on board fire, and they're off the streets. Even if it's a, a brief episode or it's a protracted issue, you know, those, those are kind of the, the legally tenable progressive things that we do to try to help the people, priority number one, but also it's kind of quality of life issues that people have a difficulty with downtown. We're doing all kinds of interventions, and, and this is one of the biggest ones. And it's, because, it's again a model across the state. In fact, Sergeant Kierwack runs it, and he was just asked to speak at a regional um, conference, a worldwide conference on this very issue and how the program works, and et cetera. So. Okay, helpful. Thank you. Uh, Council of Thank you. Um Chief, on that 300 registered sex offenders, uh -huh. with the difficulties that we did have in Ward 6 a couple of years ago for almost 11 months, I know for a fact because when we've had the police department come to Briarwood and have meetings with our residents, it was mentioned several times about ordinances being put in place. I talked with Bill Newman and he said, don't go that way. Who, who said the ordinances? Not my people. No, the residents. Right. Okay. You can't. The statute includes you can't discriminate at a right. residence. They, exactly. Yeah. They <laughs> wanted a distance, like 500 feet away mm -hmm. from a school. And Bill Newman told me, he said, don't go that way. Well, uh, my recommendation yeah, yeah. too, but was great. Well, I'm sorry, and I think this is a worthy conversation, but unfortunately there's a budget hearing. And and we too often stray away from budgetary issues. And I think, and actually, I think before the clarification, there's not 300 sex offenders, as I understand. There's 300 registrations, which some are some of the same person registering multiple times. Oh, okay. And so, so I, I I'm a little concerned that, that number gets out and it's amplified in some other ways. So that's to make that distinction. But I think if we the I, I think this going forward, and also with the fire department and all the other departments, if we keep. And I think there's a budgetary tie-in as the, as the chief is making, but I think if we're going to talk about policies without a fiduciary link, I think that we're kind of straying from our mission here on that. I understand what you're saying, but he is talking about a situation which could be involved with his budget, and I just wanted to let him know about his department. But, um, working with my residents. Well, and I appreciate that, yes. And I think, I think uh, that's good, and I think uh, the... The chief could probably use any reinforcing uh, and kudos. And I'm, I'm sure he'd, he'd resent me cutting off anyone providing kudos, but the fact is that I bet he'd like even more to get out of here quicker. But so I'm just well, guessing. He, I don't yeah. want to he got as long as you want. <laughs> right. He got a lot of kudos for my residents okay. on the police station. Okay. Uh, Council Freeman Daniels. Thank you. Uh, chief, at, the, uh, at an earlier meeting, you mentioned that. Uh, this budget would mean that uh, there would be fewer services downtown. Is that, is that right? I haven't got that point 14 yet. I was still talking about what they're Oh, so we're. No. we're let's Here's your segue. Would you like me to talk about our point 14 now? That's our Yes. Why not? Why not? <laughs> Why not? So, FY14 presented some challenges back in February when we started talking about um, the landscape of, of what the budget looks for for the city, meaning like Susan and David, uh, the mayor. Uh, we were given a clear goal as to level fund. As you know, level funding is not level services. It's here's the money you got last year, fit everything you need to do inside that cap. You know, I, I commented in the narrative, you know, the 19 years I've been chief, you know, I've had the courses that talk about three year, five year strategic plan. I've never had that option. It's always start with a ceiling of money and then try to fill the services and with that. So it's, it, it's frustrating. It's constantly frustrating. But nonetheless, we did, I did what I was told to do. And um, looking at some of our OM increases, uh, which are uh, largely gasoline and uh, information technology, we have a very information uh, computer rich building that involves maintenance fees and license fees and whatnot. Uh, predicting out the budget, I knew those costs with the gas would be about 85000 more. Then we looked at other PS expenses, the contracted uh, bargaining agreements that were in place for offshore step races and whatnot. 
and all that kind of added up to about one hundred and seventy thousand uh, dollars that I have to find under the cap of the fund budget. So looking at my budget, one of the few places you can go. I mean, you can save a few bucks with paper clips and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Because our department is ninety-two percent personnel, the really only place you can look to cut is, is bodies. Okay, just by a sheer kind of confluence of things, I had four positions that hadn't been filled that were budgeted. Uh, it seemed like the prudent thing to do, given a, that I actually wouldn't be the city would be laying off bodies, but we'd be defunding these four positions to the value of about one hundred seventy-two thousand. So that's the strategy I, I took. Uh, moving forward, to different versions of budgets with the finance director and the mayor. Other contracts were settled throughout the period of time, so we had other stresses on the budget going forward. And that, that average out to about uh, 169000 So you will see, even though it was a level funded budget request from the mayor, that after you worked out various different things, it's just over a $100,000 increase to help cover the uh, increased changes in collective bargaining agreements, the step raises, the COLAs and some other finagling I did with other numbers and looking at things that we were trying to save money on. So uh, we, got, we technically met the local funding budget, but we filled it in with some personal reserves and some uh, sh shortages of personnel. And of course, as you know, the override put me in a position, hopefully, to be able to restore the funding for those four positions and be able to hire for those four positions. You know, we've been at a static number of police officers for a decade, and our call would keep going up things that we do in the hall first day, that's all time consuming. And it's addition to our normal mission. But to get to your point, Councilor Daniels, yes, there are several things that, uh, you know, doing more with less issues. Uh, and part of it is, is staffing. Uh, with those four positions gone, and not available to me to fill with three long-term injuries that have been over a year, one almost over two years, that haven't been able to come back to me. An officer that was injured that resigned, back injury, he could not come back and uh, the necessary functions of the police department. And interestingly, he didn't put in for a disability. Uh, he didn't want to burden the city with that. It was very unusual and very uh, generous of him. Um, you know, I've had positions that I'd love to go elsewhere. I've had two people that were terminated. Um, I've had two people that didn't make it through the field training program. I had three people ready to go in the February Academy, and a week before, one got called up a reservist. And the other decided he didn't want to do this yet. So it puts me in a tough position, but it also gave me the availability of the unfunded positions to try to close the budget gap. And maybe, maybe, hopefully, hopefully, uh, should the override work, I'll be able to fund and replace those positions in a timely manner. We already have two people in the queue for uh, laterals, uh, which is an addition to more than I have six vacancies, four unfunded and two that are funded that I'm trying to fill right now. So what that means. It's reduction of services, so that we're evaluating uh, everything. But clearly one thing is the commitment, and we've talked about this in the downtown business district, you know, the availability of two officers days and evenings on bikes or on foot, uh, when they've got three other cars or four other cars working in the rest of the city. Uh, the, the call load for downtown doesn't match up with the resources that we've assigned. Them. So at least one of those positions is going to be put in a cruiser. I can't have an officer going to disturbance alone going to a multiple car accident alone, or dealing with a drunk driver alone, and Florence and Leeds on King Street, <coughs> and on a bike on uh, I just can't do that. It's just bad police management. But it's going to be unfortunate unless there's police presence downtown. And we're also evaluating the calls that we respond to. There's a lot of things that we do as a service that we might not be able to do. Um, I've had to make an adjustment on my supervisory staffing because of the shortage of officers. I took her detective lieutenant and reassigned her to patrol. If I promoted a sergeant on, from this last exam, then it's another police officer vacancy, and I just can't afford to do that. Plus, we have what I say, tongue in cheek, a young department that utilizes family medical leave. Everybody's having children. Everybody takes use of their 10 or 12 weeks, and that's another gap that's a scheduling nightmare for us. Uh, so, we're working very short handed. It's not just we have X amount of people and we have that, minus the injuries, and minus the shortages minus the uh, sick time, to the point where we announced about a month ago that unless you have contractually uh, guaranteed signed vacation time coming up in this year, you could very well be denied during time off, and that they would be eligible for being recalled from time off. Not a popular thing, not good for morale, but it's a reality. We're already in a position that we have forced overtime on a fairly regular basis just to fill our minimum staffing which means at the end of a 
ship that if somebody calls in sick and somebody's got to stay. Not helpful. Not nice to have tired officers up there. You don't want crazy police officers flying over. So yeah, there's a lot of things trimming our train, which is so important. You know, I won't have the ability to take officers from their assigned shifts and send them to training without paying them overtime because it's just going to leave a shift too short. So there's a lot of ripple effects, um, many of which I shared, shared with Pam with a request about, um, you know, the things that, the, the negative repercussions. But we're, we're strongly committed to be able to deliver services. I talk about this to my supervisors and some of my officers, and I go, you know what? We'll get through this. We've got to report. And they will. And we will. And we'll continue to deliver the services of the city. So. Uh, Council Premier down to you. Just to continue in the, in the van I started down. Uh, so two, it looks as though at least two officers that, you, you're, that we're accustomed to seeing downtown on foot will not be either on foot or on bicycle? Uh, it'll be a day-to-day -day call depending on staff. Mm -hmm. But that, that regular commitment that has been, that we've been accustomed to in the past year, not as much? No. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, Council Large. Um, Chief, I'm uh, talking about also the career incentives, and I know at one point during a budget hearing, you had brought up about when we do the career incentives, then after they're trained in that, then all of a sudden they give their resignation as they're leaving, and they either go to the state police force or they go somewhere else. And we talked about. Well, will the city have some form of protection? Like if we're spending money on training and then all of a sudden they leave? I'm not sure what your definition of career, career incentives are. She means the academy costs, I think. We've talked about right. before. Academy costs, academy Yes. Uh, you know, we're not alone here. Framing hands have the same difficulty. You know, they're poaching people, offering bonuses. Connecticut's doing the same thing. <clears throat> and it's, it's, it's a different generation, and we've sent people that I've had to train to try to understand the generation. Uh, it, there's not that much to stay in place, so much more to a mobile when it comes to geographical, you know, and the ones. I mean, out of the 10 in the past 18 months, we lost 10. Two were terminated, two didn't make the same trains. Uh, one left, two left for smaller departments, let's say, because we're too busy. I don't know how you expect that to happen. And so went to greener pastures, you know, substantially more expensive. Higher paid departments. So you could probably have some kind of contract to force somebody to stay here against their will. I don't want that kind of employee. You don't want that kind of officer going to your door. Don't count my time. I've got 341 days left before I'm out of this contract. Uh, that's Chiefs of Police Legal Counsel, Jack Collins, who we talked about this years ago about trying to force people into the it, It's it sounds maybe fiscally okay, but it's probably just not good management practices in terms of your personnel. And like life, we're poaching people too from other departments. So it's you know it's it's a constant changing population moving to places. It's a different world than my generation of the folks that follow me. Thank you. Council Carr. Just one clarification, Chief Jim. So the um, the budget shows the four unfunded. Uh, positions that are in the patrol category, and then three vacancies. So one as a lieutenant, an admin position, and then two patrol. So the, will those vacancies be filled? Are we looking to fill those this, this year? There's four officer vacancies for FY14 that are not funded. I have two additional okay. vacancies that are funded. Oh, okay. And then, you're, and also the lieutenant position is funded. The type of lieutenant. Watson is retiring. That's another one of the ten. That that promotion was made. That transfer was made into the detective group. And the second supervisor, which nice in there, just by sheer staffing, um, moving her over to the patrol and utilizing that money for, to cover some other gaps in the budget. If we are able to hire enough officers, laterals that we get, if we the override works and I get those four positions, then that detective sergeant can go back to being detective sergeant. But that's just the, the magic of moving numbers around. So. Okay, thank you. 
have any other questions? Way out of time. I don't know what to do with it. Um, Chief, I appreciate your time. I, I think, you know, uh, given the context of which for having these budget discussions also in the context of cause and effect uh, playing out with some of the pressures downtown and some of the pressures in the community. I, I have made a point emphasizing over and over again when I've been on the news, which apparently is popular these days for some reason, I can't remember. But I've emphasized the fact that we're one of the safest communities in the state. And that is actually part and parcel due to a police department that that functions well and effectively and is well managed. That is, and without without too many overt incidents incidences that that, that tend to uh, be more extreme headline grabbers, we actually, as a community, the reason that we have a popular downtown is largely the fact that the, there is a rightful understanding of the level of safety that, that people come have come to expect in the community. And the concern, of course, is jeopardizing that sense of well-being. And, uh, and I know that your department will be committed to that regardless of the circumstances. But the fact is, is that I think that it's incumbent upon us to fund a program that we come to rely on when it's missing and ignore it when it's working. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Uh, Captain Conkis also appreciate you coming by. Yes, thanks thank thanks for the very nice card, by the thank way. Thank you for that. Congratulations. And thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Cap Captain Savito sends his uh, regrets. He's uh, assistant coach of our Tampa baseball. Uh, 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 well, I'm sure today, they won 95. They're moving on in the tournament. So. Well, <laughs> tell so, Captain uh, Savino, I'm sure his regrets were genuine. <laughs> that we, we missed him. <laughs> thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Otter's office. Uh, it's on page 27 in the budget book. And school policies. Um, that includes uh, financial reporting to the state and federal agencies, maintaining a complete set of financial records, um, reconciliation of treasurer and collector's cash. Um, and there's, as I go along, you can get more detail on statistics of number of warrants and total payrolls and such. Um, for the payroll, the staff audits and verifies employees' payroll to ensure that records and benefits are current and accurate. Uh, the auditor's office enters 21 departments um, and we also um, verify and produce the W-2s for the city. Um, accounts payable, um, we audit and verify all the invoices for city departments, the schools, um, and enterprise funds. Um, in accordance with the MGL and city policies. And for procurement, um, again, we review all contracts for the departments in the city, NPS, Misfolk, and enterprise funds um, in accordance to appropriation and to Chapter 30B. Um, in the budget book, you'll see the FY14 budget for the operating budget has been reduced. Um, this is due to the charter change where the independent auditing services are now out of the council's that's our budget now. Yeah. Right. Council's budget. So the OM um, budget for the auditor's office is $2,500. Um, it is for archive retention, office supplies, and professional development. Um, and for the PS, we have five staff members, myself, the assistant city auditor, uh, chief procurement officer, and two accounts, um, principal account clerks. Um, so if you have any questions that I can answer for you. Yes. Uh, Council LeBarge. Um, again, on the procurement officer position, and plus you. I know last time when we had you at the budget hearing, um, you explained that you can do, and you are certified to do procurement. I do not. I'm not certified as a CPO, Chief Procure, for the MCPPO. I have not attended those classes. Joe Cook, the Chief Procurement Officer, has. And do you do training? We do training to departments on how to put together a contract, um, what they need to submit, what they need to check, whether the thresholds require bids or um, uh, advertisements in newspapers. Um, and Joe Cook works closely with the I'll departments on that. Parts of it. Mm -hmm. And you have the same staff. 
I've been there 60 years, uh, Chief Procurement Officer 24, uh, the Assistant City Auditor and one uh, Principal Clerk 17 years, and we have a new person who's been there two years. Another clerk. I want to thank you and your department for doing such a great job. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Joyce? Gene. I'm sorry, Councilman Daisy. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> We're all friends here. The, uh, I just have a quick interaction with um, DPW on enterprise funds. Is that, is that something that happens? Is that weekly, monthly? Is that part of your uh, uh, weekly meeting uh, when all the department heads get together? Or I'm just curious as to how you interact with the DPW, the Board of Public Works. Um, I review the funds that they have on a regular basis. Um, we uh, review all the accounts payables. Every invoice that goes through the city is yeah. paid, whether it's school, enterprise, any city department. The auditor's office reviews it, makes sure there's all the backup documentation. They have grants at the Department of Public Works, and I review them. I'm looking at all grants now closely because we're so close to the end of the fiscal year, make sure no one's in deficit. Um, if there's a miscoding, we check that out. Um, so I, I, I do work with the DPW and their business manager there. And so, the so you're the one that keeps track of the grants and then? Well, each department is responsible for tracking their own grants. I, as auditor, has the overview, so I make sure that um, that at the end of the fiscal year um, that there isn't a grant that's going to be in deficit that's going to um, uh, impact our fee cash for the next fiscal year. Okay. That was kind of my question. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Sorry, Joyce. I mean, we could have kept a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to yeah, add, I just wanted to thank Joyce and her staff because they, um, yeah, uh, they work very closely with my office, uh, and particularly since we've been having spending advisories in place around so everything that. Uh, all those spending items that have to get reviewed by by myself, so we work very closely, and they're also um, I call them eagle eyes because they're always on the lookout for any kinds of issues or discrepancies and bringing those to my attention. Um, so they they truly are the sort of the, the fiscal watchdogs um, for the city in terms of making sure that we're doing everything correctly uh, and uh, and keeping uh, my office informed of any issues. And obviously they're an important part of the financial team. So I just wanted to add that. Mm -hmm. um, That's good. Yeah, and I think, um, as you well know, I probably bother your staff more than anybody in the city. And uh, always professional, always helpful. Thank you very much yeah. to all your staff. Thank you. I will. Thank you. Well, Joyce, um, appreciate you stopping by. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the time that you've invested in your job and doing actually yes, the yeah. unheralded uh, work that the mayor just described. And um, and I appreciate your report. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Next up, with DC North, DC Nichols uh, in the year in the house, uh, we're coming representing the fire department. Hey, we have the chief is actually supposed to be here. The chief is on the way. Scheduled for. so far ahead of schedule. Oh yeah, we are ahead of schedule. Holy cats! <laughs> um, actually, why don't we call recess since we're not broadcasting live? And did. Uh, maybe, you know, wherever you can find a better camera angle or something like that, and we can all, uh, we'll just take advantage of the fact that we have, that we're actually running ahead of schedule, and uh, since this is a publicly advertised hearing, it's only fair that we actually start the hearing at the time. Well, pizza. Yeah. There you go. Lots of pizza. Second. Yeah. Second pizza. Second pizza. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We're coming out of recess as City Council FY 2014 budget hearing for the Northampton City Council. I am uh, Council President Bill Dwight. Um, the remainder of this hearings, we will uh, hear from the Fire Department, the Planning Department, Central Services Department, Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School, coming up at 7.30. Um, right now, uh, available to us to speak is on the Fire Department. Here, uh, is Chief Duggan is here with 
DC North, DC Nichols, also here present as well as page. I'm sorry? Assistant Chief. Assistant Chief, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> whoa, whoa. Uh, page 58 in your budget book. Uh, chiefs, or Chief, whichever piece you want to go up. Um, what, what we've been doing is allowing department has the opportunity either to give us a thumbnail if they want, or we can just cut to the questions, whatever your preference is. Okay, well, I, I will do a thumbnail just to sort of orient everyone, and, right. and I'll probably multiply to include uh, Deputy Chief Norris and Assistant Chief Nichols as we go through some of it. Very so, good. Um, so, so as you can see in the budget book, this is a, a level-funded budget uh, representing roughly $5 million. Uh, one thing to certainly focus your attention on is this is the second year that the fire budget includes EMS. So if you remember in years past, we were coming before the council for transfers to populate the EMS budget. Last year we consolidated those and this is the second year of that consolidation. So if you look back several years, you'd see a vast difference between our budgets then and now uh, based on that consolidation. Uh, in terms of the personnel services budget, uh, we have the same uh, staff members. Uh, there was one position that was half funded last year based on a retirement and is now fully funded in this year as the new employee came on. And this is the last year of our SAFER grant. So SAFER is um, basically a grant that provided us with four firefighters where it's a three-year grant fully paid for in year one and two. In the third year, it's municipalities' responsibility to pay for that. And um, the, the grant SAFER stands for Staffing for Adequate Fire and Emergency Response. So across the country, these grants are out and they basically pay for three years or two years of a fully funded position, including benefits. What we're doing in this year is the city has paid the benefits throughout the first two years. What we have as tailings from those benefits will in essence pay for the third year as we close the grant out. So there is no direct impact to the tax base on that. We're working this as we have three years of grant. Um, our OM budget is reduced by 17000 That really slides us toward the uh, PS budget. Um, and, and we'll go into some of the, the challenges that, that creates and some of the changes. So, so I think our biggest challenge is going to be keeping vehicles running. And I'm going to ask Assistant Chief Nichols to talk about that in a little bit. But if you look at our OM budget, there are accounts that have gone up and down. Uh, that's based on two things. One, a trend analysis of what we've currently spent in this year and the previous year. And two, trying to be as frugal as possible to slide some money toward the PS budget uh, based on the, the steps that have been given uh, in this year and last year with the settlement. Um, so, so in terms of uh, PS, certainly this year has been a good year. I, I think I've stood before the council time and time again asking for overtime transfers. If you remember 10 years ago, they were in the order of a quarter million dollars a year. Uh, this year, not only will we not require a transfer, but money from both PS, permanent salaries, and overtime will subsequently be returned. So the uh, overtime analysis we did, we brought the overtime from about 99000 to neat ringtone, <laughs> um, to what our five-year trend was. And, and if we look at it right now, we're going to be under that five-year trend in this year. That doesn't say that next year it won't go up. It's subject to a lot of drivers, such as injuries, sickness, things like that. Um, so that's going to be the good news for this year, and we're going to level fund going into next year on that. Certainly one of the challenges that, that we're all aware of is we're entering the third year without a contract or completing the third year without a contract, and we're waiting for an arbitration settlement that will probably be here within the next two months. Certainly that arbitration settlement is going to impact us all uh, and impact the budget somewhat significantly. Um, so let's see, um, if you look at the permanent salaries line item, that's up $330,000 uh, in rough terms. Uh, and that's really based on a number of things. Uh, first of all, we had two steps in this year based on the, the settlement uh, with the, the union. Uh, we also eliminated the fire prevention account as we go into the next year. 
Uh, that, was, that account has, uh, the history of it, was it was created when we had basically no fire prevention division, and I remember when, when I came to the city, we had collected about $1,000 in fees per year. A at that point, uh, the decision was made to form a user fee-based account, and that's what the fire prevention account was. Over the last few years, what it's done is basically paid for uh, a majority of the assistant chief salary and our fire prevention captain salary. In essence, what we've done is done away with that account, move those salaries into the regular budget, and I think you'll see that noted. Uh, so what I'd like to do is ask uh, Deputy Chief Norris to just come up, give you sort of a specific briefing on EMS, uh, and then ask Assistant Chief Nichols to talk about some of the challenges. And as I said, we're going to have some real challenges with an aging fleet. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> um, as the Chief mentioned, going forward, looking into next fiscal year, we're not anticipating any huge increase in call volume. Right now, um, we're kind of trending towards anywhere between 4,600 and 4,800 calls per year for the ambulance service. Um, one of the main focuses going into next fiscal year, obviously, will be with the young department that we have uh, focusing on their continual education training, not only to meet the state minimum requirements for their certification level, but also just the, uh, to give them the ability to enhance their level of care provided to the community. In addition to that, the other focus will be on continuing to upkeep and maintain the equipment that we currently have. Uh, there's a number of uh, different types of equipment on the ambulances that require uh, service contracts, whether that's for the cardiac monitors, the automated CPR machines, and also the power stretchers that we acquired through a grant to minimize our injury potential. So those are some of the main factors we'll be monitoring going forward into next fiscal year. Just, just briefly on uh, our aging fleet out through there. Uh, currently, right now, I have two fire engines that are 1999s uh, that are gaining mileage and engine hours as we speak, uh, and it's taking a, a lot of parts and labor to uh, keep those on the road. Thankfully, we have a new engine on order, which will, I think, help greatly, uh, and also a new ambulance. Uh, but I think the challenge is going to be uh, keeping the two engines going until we get that new one in and then just maintain it and, and being able to repair that. Uh, the ambulances uh, get run hard, they get run a lot, uh, and they're fairly new, uh, but road miles get put on them and uh, it's going to be a challenge I think just to keep the maintenance up on those and to ensure that we don't you know, have any unnecessary repairs and costs to those. What's that noise? It's ironic. That, that's, that's, one of those, that's one of those 1999. Yeah, we, we timed that, and it has a big banner on it, 1999. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think we're anticipating right around the first of the year getting that new fire engine, which is going to be a huge, huge thing for us. Uh, and uh, we'll retire one of those old ones, uh, and one of those 1999s will go into the back line as a reserve. Uh, so, so the challenge, I think, will be getting to ju uh, January, and, uh, and then from there on out, just trying to maintain the fleet and keep it uh, operational and in good condition ready to go. Uh, consultation with yeah. question. Yeah, you're going to retire an old engine. Correct. Yeah. And, and where will that where will it go to? So just engine yeah, five is, it on the floor. No. So engine five is being retired. It's a 1999. It was of the two 1999s in the worst condition. It's driving by now. Um, <laughs> so what will happen is that's actually on a municipal auction site right now subject to being released when the new one is placed in service. Um, one of the things that we did is we bought a new engine through the state bid. And by doing that, typically what we do is trade in an engine, take the proceeds, and put it toward equipment. In this case, we couldn't put it toward equipment, so we're going to sell it on a municipal auction site specific to fire apparatus, tends to generate the best value, and then I'll be coming back before the council for a transfer of at least a good portion of those funds to fund equipment on the new vehicle. So trade-in value was zero? Uh, trade-in value, if we traded it in through uh, just a normal purchase, would probably get between ten and $15,000. Uh, right now I have it advertised on this auction site. It's advertised at between eighty and 90000 I don't imagine we're going to get that, but we're going to see. Craigslist. Uh, no. Kidding. <laughs> uh, you said you had there was some money returning that was being turned back in from PS and, right. and overtime. Mm -hmm. how, how much is that? 
Um, roughly about 200,000, I believe the finance director would probably be, uh, have a better projection than I do. But ba basically, as we went into fiscal 13, we had six openings. And under the SAFER grant, we have a window of six months to hire those people to keep the number up. We took the full six months and hired them basically in December into January. So with that, we had those salaries that were sitting there, uh, and those salaries have accumulated and will be turned back, as well as we are currently under projection for overtime. Could I just, I, I just have to also add that you, you also have to keep in context that this is a department that does not have a contract for 11, 12, or 13. So there's a whole pent up amount of p &S that's that we don't know what that is. We, we budgeted, tried to budget for some of it, but when that JLMC award comes, um, that money will need to be absorbed somehow in the fire department budget. So it's a it's sort of a conundrum because we're you know we're making uh, you know we we're, the safer grant is requiring us to maintain the same level of funding while at the same time we're reducing funding in the other public safety department. Um, but then we've also got this other thing looming there that's going to come along, and uh, so. Even though there's this excess money, um, trust me, it's most likely spoken for. Mm -hmm. so, so that was my yeah. point. I just it wasn't like a pot of money that we could. Yeah. Yeah. That was my so point. I, just, I wanted to put that in the right context. Okay. And, and uh, I'm getting uh, reports on different emails and things such as that. And some communities have, have refused the safer grant. And can you? I know when we took it for particular reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and some have refused it, and then actually their their mayors have been sued for not accepting it. It's been vetoed back and forth, and there's a, it's pretty controversial right now in several uh, cities in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Can and you correct. kick that around a minute? Yeah. So, so although some have refused it, the vast majority are accepting it because obviously to apply for it, they have to have approval to apply. Um, I'm aware of two or three that have refused it. One that actually went back subsequently and has tried to then go back and get it. So it is something controversial and it's controversial relative to the requirement to keep that funding um, going forward. The, the actual safer grants that are up now are different than the one we had, uh, where it's a smaller period of time, it's 100% funded, but then the concern of the communities is the ability to, to sustain those positions in the longer term. Uh, as we looked at this, certainly it was one a way to add staff as EMS came into prime time in the department, uh, and the hope was that the revenue stream would ultimately support that. We're going to have to see next year, as the grant's gone, what revenues are and what level of staff we have. Okay, so this is the window. This is where we find out. Th this next year will certainly both produce the revenue equation, and we will not have any support for four positions moving forward. Thank you. Uh, Council Freeman Daniels. I just wanted to know that to the extent you budgeted, I mean, you really can't anticipate this, what the arbitration conclusion is going to be, but did you, so you haven't budgeted for it, you're just keeping. Right. Um, we, we've followed the, the mayor's direction, including steps for next year. Mm. Uh, but other than that, we haven't included anything because it hasn't been awarded yet. And certainly when there is an award given, both the mayor and I are legally bound to support that award. Whatever it is. Go ahead. So, um, just more question, I guess, for the mayor. That's why I have my hand up. Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, we try to anticipate. Yeah, we try to put some money. You'll know in the budget we have personnel reserves, uh, and that's sometimes that's there for collective bargaining judgments and things like that. So we've tried to anticipate some, um, but obviously we, you know, we we. We have what we believe is is um, you know, reasonable. We don't know what the uh, what the award will be. There's a quite a gulf between the two uh, sides in terms of uh, what that compensation should be. So, you know, we'll, when the award comes, we'll then have to assess what the impacts are um, on on the city budget, on the fire department budget, on staffing, etc. So, all right, thank you. Yeah. 
Council of Arts then come for Casey um, probably um, if we could recognize Chris Norris because I know he worked very closely with one of my residents and I um, going through these charts which I found very difficult to figure out and I want to thank you for working with the both of us on that. The question is on runs made by the ambulance where the patient has no insurance how are those bills accounted for and tracked? They're tracked on an annual basis, so what will happen with someone who doesn't have any insurance? They're submitted a number of invoices. Um, they have the ability also to request through the department uh, either an abatement or a payment plan. And then um, after at least six payments go out, it basically just gets written off as an adjustment, as a non-collected bill. then we lose the money, correct? Potentially, yes. On runs made by the ambulance where insurance pays only a portion of a bill for service, how is that indicated and tracked? The, the same way on those, we get monthly reports from our third party billing agency is Coastal Medical Billing. And who's the third party? Coastal Medical Billing. They're our third party billing agency. So they give us monthly reports. And in those monthly reports, there's some different columns. One of them is commitments, which shows the amount of money collected. One of them is adjustments. So on those partial payments that you're referencing, yeah. the money that's not collected will be shown in that adjustment column. Um, one of the questions, Chris, you had mentioned something to the effect about aging. What do you mean by that? It's just, it showed different insurance carriers uh, submit their pay payments at different time intervals. So, uh, Health New England, you may see a aging payment in less than 60 days, where um, Mass Health or Medicare payment, you might not see them 90 days. So that's what we call an aging report, is it ages over the time. How much money would you say we have lost without having anybody having health insurance to pay? Or a payment plan or anything? I wouldn't even be comfortable taking a guess at that right now. Um, it's not a lot, right? It, it's not a lot. When you look at our collection rate after adjustment, it's always between, historically, between 92 and 94 percent after the adjustment. Okay. Thank you. And let me sort of add to that. Um, first of all, when I do my taxes every year, you get to fill out the HC form that says you have health insurance in Massachusetts. So I, when we look at our payer mix, most people do have health insurance and the, the rates that we set are purposely set to anticipate adjustments so that we from private insurers get the maximum revenue back. Uh, one of the things that, that we just did is we went to what's called a um, StatNet meeting in Charlton, Mass and it was focused on fire services where they did an analysis of different services sort of what they pay for the third-party billing service we were one of the lowest uh, and what the revenue equation is, and we were one of the highest uh, on that. So if you look externally, that says we're doing exceptionally well. Thank you, Chief. Uh, yeah, uh, last year, the, the budget did look a little bit different. I had asked BMS versus fire safety, and the answer was it cost $2.4 million for EMS and it was 3.6 for fire, for fire suppression. Is that still about the same? Um, I guess I'd have to go back through that and probably the best way to do it is the way we look at it is EMS actually contributes towards safety on the fire ground. So if you look at prior to us absorbing EMS, the number of people we put on the scene of a structure fire was far lower and below national standards. Since we've gone to full EMS, the number of people we're putting on the fire ground is far more compliant with those standards and much higher. Uh, and that's just the way it works out. If you listen to the radio tapes from the December 27th arson fires, you'd find that ambulances are clearing the hospital after doing a cardiac arrest, grabbing a piece of fire apparatus, going to the scene. Things like that all contribute. And if we were to restore just the fire service that was there prior to EMS, the staffing level was 10 people on duty. Now we're at 12. 
So okay, I just curious because when I had asked the question last year, you were right. you were pretty comfortable with 2.4 and 3.6. It just came right up. So I just that's why that's why I was asking if, if, if you still think it's the same. You don't know. I, I don't know exactly what it is this yeah. year. I, I'd say if you'd like a financial analysis of it, it, it should sort of be done by the finance director. Okay. Thank you. Oh, oh, excuse me. Um, is 80% of all the call volume still EMS? 75 to 80%? Uh, yeah. 75 to 80%. And of that, and 100% of the EMS call volume, I was going to ask pretty much the same question, but a little bit differently. What would that percentage be of those that do not get paid? And also, what would be the percentage of calls that you get that actually result in a transfer? So to answer your second question first. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Uh, the number out of the, all the EMS calls, the number of transports usually trends over the course of a year around 80% of those calls that we respond to, we transport a patient. And then in terms of out of those that we transport that don't have insurance, percentage-wise, it's, it's minimal. When you look at a payer mix that the chief mentioned earlier, those with no insurance, it, it's minimal. Okay, so the rates that are set, are they set in your department or are they set by Coastal Medical or do they just put together invoices? They're based off of what Medicare sets the rate, and our rates, like other industry standards, are based off of what Medicare allows. So we bring those rates forward that are endorsed by the Public Safety Committee. Okay. Thank you. Council of Barnes. Thank you. Um, one more. Okay, say that a bill that has been sent out and there's no resolution with it and it's taking longer than a year okay, to find out what's happening and why it's not being paid. So how do you track that from the physical year to the next physical year? It either continues on the reports as a continued adjustment or at the end of each fiscal year, would they send us a abatement request list? So out of those that aren't paid up, we can go back and review the calls. Um, they have the ability to submit an abatement request or a payment plan, and we can either approve or deny that or make an adjustment to that. Okay. That's time consuming. It is. Yes. Huh. Thank you. I want to thank the chief fire department again for everything that you do in the city to keep everybody safe. And I know you all work very tirelessly when you're out there with fires and whatever, but thank you. Councilor Tacey. Yep. I know in, um, this is probably not even fair, well, in two, uh, and this is 2005 I'm talking about. In 2005, we had um, the conflict with commerce insurance, and I remember that the goal was to collect unpaid invoices from the commerce insurance company. And in the end of and the end result was even due to a skillful defense on our part, we were unable to reach a settlement agreement with the Commerce Insurance Company on the, on the hazmat stuff. So we wrote this off as a bad debt because we didn't have any more money for litigation. Are we doing something differently now? Because I have not seen that in any budget notes since then. Is there something that, I, I'm wondering, I'm trying to figure out what happened and why we haven't seen that anymore. Uh, we're still doing hazardous material billing for motor vehicle accidents, especially when there's a fluid release and so forth. Uh, that money flows into the hazmat account, replaces speedy dry booms, pads, things like that. If someone's gear gets contaminated, it replaces that. Um, and, and the billing continues. Insurance companies across the Commonwealth are sort of resisting it, much as Commerce did. We spent $12,500 on that litigation with Commerce, and we decided to pull back because right now, across the state, many communities are looking at a class action suit. Uh, under Mass General Law, Section 21E, uh, the state believes that we have the ability to recoup our costs, uh, but 
it would take a class action suit to move it forward. So we're continuing to invoice and bill as time permits. So we're not invoicing any differently than we were in 2004, 2005? No, we certainly have less capacity, so it's taking us more time to do that. I think right now we're a few months behind in doing that, but we're continuing down that road. Okay, and, and they're still resisting paying? Absolutely. Some pay, some don't. And do we have a, a particular insurance company in the Commonwealth that pays better than the others? Or? There I know are, Commerce is the biggest. Right. There, <coughs> there are some that, that we'd have to look back at the records of who pays the best and who doesn't. I don't have that off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you, um, you said that you were eliminating the, uh, you're not eliminating the, the charging of fees for fire safety. You, no. You're just not having, not keeping it in its own fund, is that the idea? Right, so, so remember, as this started off, the fire department was collecting $1,000 or less per year, and the decision was made to go to a user fund model. At that point, I ran fire prevention for about 18 months, and based on the fees that were put forward through council and approved by the mayor, those fees were put into a um, revolving account. Subsequently, that allowed us to uh, bring staff on to do fire prevention. So in the last few years, it's paid for a portion of our assistant chief, Dwayne Nichols, and Larry Therrien, our fire prevention captain. As we looked at it in this year, pretty much all that account was doing was trying to sort of keep its head above water with the, the fiscal crisis we're sort of on the tail end of, hopefully, and it was paying those salaries. So it would move those salaries into the budget, and the fees that are generated will go to the general fund. All right. Um, so it's really just a change in accounting. Yes. Second question. Um, you just you mentioned in your maybe I'm just missing it, but you mentioned in your um, budget message that you're working on training. But am I reading it wrong that your your training line item is zero? So are you getting just entirely grants for for your training, or at least it, it's zero in person in personnel? Um, okay, zero in personnel services. So our training line item has gone from seven hours maybe twenty thousand. Um, well, on the OM side, it's gone from twenty-eight thousand to twenty thousand again, with the emphasis of trying to shift toward PS to accommodate that. Um, so some of the training that's put in here in the PS budget was when we'd bring reserve people on and train them to then go on shift. Right now, we just hired six people to fill those vacancies by Safer. And with that, we're not going into the fiscal year with the need to hire anyone. If you asked me the same question last year, I'd say we need to hire six or, or five or whatever it was at that particular time. But th that's another way we've sort of spread the, the ability of the, the PS budget to absorb where we are. Okay. Okay. Is uh, Council of Guardians and Council of Safety. I think I heard you just say something about six new staff, sorry. Yeah, we, we hired six new staff uh, at the end of December, beginning of January. And that was required based on, as we went into the current fiscal year we're in, we were down six openings based on retirements, people that went to other departments. And we had the requirement under the SAFER grant, we have a six month window yeah. to bring the staff back up. Okay. We took all of that six months and that's how those salaries accumulated that, that ultimately will create a positive balance back uh, at the end of the year. How many retired? Did you know? Two. Two retired? Two. Two retired, four went to other places. Wow. Okay. Council Yeah, and for uh, Deputy Chief Norris, eh? uh, the, our backup ambulance is who? Is, is alert, I understand? No. Um, in our matrix, our first call down is Pioneer Valley Ambulance. And is that that's prior to mutual aid? That is, that would be mutual aid. Pioneer Valley Ambulance Services is, is considered your mutual aid a partner in this? If all of our ambulances were tied up on calls and we didn't have personnel staffing in our ambulances and a call came in that needed a med uh, medical response, then we'd call mutual aid. So our first mutual aid call would be the Pioneer Valley Ambulance. Okay, and from there is a matrix that goes down. Um, for example, East Hampton would be next, and then it rolls through a whole list. Um, especially important when we have major incidents in the city. Yeah. Now, the, office, the OEMS, what 
what are they what are they re in your in your zone plan? What do they require? Do they require you to have a local what's your requirement for a backup? Both in our license and in the service zone, they require that matrix that we're talking about. So in the event that all of our primary ambulances weren't available, they require every service to have a, a backup plan, a mutual aid plan. Yeah. So ours goes Pioneer Valley Ambulance, then East Hampton, um, Amherst, and it builds out from there. Um, the same thing, we have both mutual aid and intercepts. So we have the same call down list if an intercept is needed. So, so you submit a plan every year? Under our license, yes. The every state, year? The state comes in once a year at a minimum, yeah. and they review all of these records, part of which is those mutual aid yeah. uh, calls. So, so they don't really have criteria that says you have to hire an ambulance. How close? Just that they have to approve whatever your plan is. They really don't tell you how close an ambulance service would have to be to provide you with backup service. They require you to have agreements in place with the closest, most appropriate service. Closest, most appropriate. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Council No, I'm all set. Thank You're you. All set. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Appreciate your time and, uh, and your service as well. And, and uh, we'll see you around town from time to time. Have them around the 1999 vehicles, perhaps I don't know. Uh, best of luck. Thank you so much for coming by. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just do a quick closing comment? Yep. Um, so we talked a lot about ambulance and finances. So I just suggest that the council should also think about some of the other benefits of the ambulance service beyond finances. The, the ability to augment fire protection. The response times that as we went over them today in a city staff meeting were 4.6 or 7 minutes in Northampton. That's something that is really unheard of even in some municipal services. So our people do a really good job, and th there's other benefits to just consider beyond the financial equation. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So that brings up another question. Oh, you know, well, you, just you started it. Just spoke to a question. Uh, the city stat meeting, that's not the same as your stat net meeting. No. Okay, where was the stat net meeting held? Where, did, where, are, the, where are those held? Uh, Charlton Mass. Charlton Mass. Okay. That's part of our participation in the stat net network. Yeah. And, and so we, we had city staff that go to those on a monthly basis. I actually pulled that up online. Yep. Yep. Yeah. This morning. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon or good evening. Um, we're damn close to schedule. Um, next up is the planning department. Record five is here. It's uh, page 46 in your budget book. Wayne is welcome. Hi. Um, we've been giving everyone an opportunity either to, to provide us with a brief narrative or you can go directly to the questions or we can go behind with curtain number three if you're interested, but your choice is up to you. <laughs> I'll be giving a very brief narrative and right. take questions. Um, so, you know, you can guess our budget is overwhelmingly staff, um, and so we're not really anticipating any changes this year in terms of staff or basic core functions for what we do. Um, in terms of budget cut to deal with the city's uh, budget issues, we cut an engineering account that we have, um, which is an account, you know, it's one of the sort of like, like all cuts I'm sort of seeing. It's one of those cuts that we can live with, but it's unfortunate um, because what we often do is when we apply for grants for projects, it's often the first dollar that's hardest to get. So often we're doing a few hundred dollars or a couple thousand dollars in terms of feasibility, which may show up later with a hundred thousand or a million dollar grant. Um, and so what is passed out, Councilor Freeman Daniels asked for a list of all the grants which we administer, and so that's what's circulating. But you get a sense if you look at the grants, sort of what are the consequences. Many, most of these grants had some lead time in it. So the, the VA hospital, for example, the uh, park and ride lot. This is a close to a million dollar project. It's being built by the Commonwealth and designed by the Commonwealth. We had to do a little bit of feasibility work early in the process a long time ago. So, so that's sort of the consequence of the cut. Um, otherwise, we're sort of be doing generally what we're doing. Our office is split into uh, a lot of overlapping functions, but um, so we administer grants in major projects. Uh, we, we do about two million dollars a year in terms of projects. Some are leveraging other people, like the VA hospital, 
we're frankly for a million dollar project, it wasn't an enormous amount of our time. Um, and some projects are very hands-on, um, like bike path extensions. So it's a whole range of those projects. So that's sort of one category. Um, obviously, administering permits for a host of boards that we administer 17 different permit applications. Um, we used to, years ago, if you look at our budget, we would have bragged about the number of permits that we issue. We've sort of, in some ways, gone the other direction. We see us needing to issue permits in some ways saying the system isn't working. So we're looking at how, and so we spend a lot of staff time looking at what are the things which we know, which we approve all, all the time, and make those things allowed by right. And so we've been cutting back the number of permits that we issue. Now, of course, what happens is we cut back permits like a window replacement on Elm Street, and we don't cut out permits like a subdivision. So the permits we issue are bigger projects, and so it doesn't save that much staff time. But if you're the person who wants to replace a window or wants that porch, it's really important. So look at all those regulations. Um, and then the other big function, obviously, is long-range planning. It shows up in everything from the transportation plan we've done downtown, to the open space plan, to sustainable North Hampton plan. And so it's a host of those plans keeping up to date. Um, and then there's other functions, but they're more support issues. So, for example, you know, we manage a lot of conservation lands in the city, and we've really had a big initiative um, in the last two years since the current mayor sort of to clean up our backlog of maintenance. And so we've gone through and looked at hazard trees and trash piles and those kinds of things. But that's more supporting everything else. So I can give as much detail as you want, but that's a quick overview. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, Councilor Adams, did you have your hand up? No, I didn't. You did? Okay. Councilor Casey. Yeah. I'll take the brownfields for 200 right um, Is the Pleasant Street due diligence? Can you explain that one to me for a minute? Sure. So there's two, three aspects of this project. Um, one is the city's been looking for a while at, is it in our interest to take over a portion of Pleasant Street, the state layout? Um, when state layout, it is a highway, and so there's no room for cars can't park there. You know, and so cars speed up very quickly to downtown. And so the city taking over allows us to narrow Pleasant Street, allows us to do on-street parking. Given the environmental history of the site, we want to make sure that we're not getting a huge liability for the city. So the biggest part of this is just looking at Pleasant Street and making sure we don't open up a liability. The second part, which is smaller but may, may or may not still be an opportunity for the city, the city, we believe, is clouded title, owns a very small parcel of land um, on the corner of um, Pleasant Street and Wright Avenue, um, which we, it was the Northampton Dyke Company. And when the Northampton Dyke Company went bankrupt, we believe it came to the city. Again, we need more deed research. But that's a site that could be a park, it could be a small economic development opportunity, but again, we need to know if it's a clean site. Um, and then the final site, the one that's the biggest challenge is more an economic development standpoint, is the old Staub service station, which is now Pleasant Journey, which used to cross Pleasant Street, um, yeah. is trying to figure out what their issues are, if we can do anything to bring that to closure so that you know we can get more development yeah. in the site. And, there was, and across it was also, there was savings, coal, oil, and lubricant. Right, right. The issue is groundwater movement, as far as we can tell, in that area is from west to east. So the coal site, if it's contaminated, doesn't affect any city property. Um, and that property's been on the market and they've done due diligence. They hired a firm out of Springfield. And so we weren't that concerned about that. The, the, the Staub service station, because it's on the west side of the street, if there's movement of, of oil, it's across the street, which we, we may someday own. Okay, so that's why we're more concerned. About it. And we don't have any liability at all in this our agreement with this park and ride at the VA for anything on that. But I mean, that's been a Right. It's been a parking lot for asbestos and lead and things over the years, um, and I know they had huge trouble with their landfill just three or four hundred yeah. feet away. Um, we have no liability for the parking lot itself. It's owned by the VA. The VA was happy to take care of maintenance responsibilities. Um, the only new liability to get, which was city picked up, is the signal in front of the VA used to be a VA-owned signal. Right. As part of this deal, it comes to the city, and obviously it's the maintenance responsibility. That's the only thing. So it's the project you said is state funded. Project well state and federal. It's state, state and federal funded. And federal. Okay. So we don't have anything at all to do with the construction of that lot. Um, a little bit of staff time to make sure we're getting what we've all agreed to do. Yeah. But otherwise, oh again, the signal needs to be covered. Yeah. 
Right. And if they dig a hole and they dig into something that's awful, it's nothing to do with us. That's right. The only piece okay. that is city property okay. is, again, the roadbed, and we're also putting up a, a ramp onto the bike path. Yeah. And so that's obviously back on city property. But nothing where the lot is, nothing with the VA property. Yeah. Okay. I have some longtime residents of Leeds that have asked me to ask that question. Um, thank you. How is it that some CPA funds are used to pay for salaries? So it's an eligible cost. CPA money is voted for. It's the idea for CPA is basically be self-supported for the staff who's working on CPA not to be coming out of the general fund. So that the time, we have two people in my office who spend some time on it, and in essence, their staff time is 100% covered by CPA. The portion of the staff time is on the project. There is some, what, what's the percentage of CPA funds that can go for administrative use? You know, you know, I know we're, we're significantly below what's allowed. I don't yeah. remember what the percentage is. Five percent. Five percent. Five percent. Thank you very much for this. Um, this uh, looks like an Excel spreadsheet. Is that right? Um, Sorry to comment. Yes. No. Well, it had to fit on the page. I. Uh, this is, I mean, this is just a back of the envelope calculation, but it, it looks as though from the last, from last year and this year, um, you're administering roughly over over 2.2 million dollars in state and federal grants. Okay. Um, that that those are grants that the city the city is awarded for different projects that that your office does with with other partners, of course. So um, your budget of of uh, a quarter million dollars is, um, I think, an excellent investment. It's a tremendous value, considering that uh, and not even, and not we're not even talking about CPA funds, which are raised locally. But the amount of dollars that that your office brings in uh, from state and federal um, is is commendable, and uh, it pays for a lot of the uh, improvements that we uh, that we. Um, have come to really appreciate in this city and uh, and can't get because of our tight budget. Um, and uh, you know sometimes we, uh, we we do take a lot of heat for uh, for uh, approving these sorts of grants because it it's assumed that uh, we could just use that money for operating costs and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, you know number one we can't uh, and number two. Um, I'm, I'm glad that we can deflect it from you and your office, um, so that you can continue to uh, to reach for these these um, these state and federal funds to uh, enhance the quality of our life here in Northampton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Casey, and then It's too bad that this isn't live streaming because um, I wanted you to explain to us here. But I really want to just explain to the public the importance of the GIS coordinator in your in your office because that's another loaded question I get constantly. Well, this this is being recorded, so it will be the right. NCTV will be broadcasting. It's just that yes, they don't get to experience it in the moment, I suppose. Which yeah, I don't think we're here too many people complain about, but but I find it I, I, I find it extremely important the position. So, so um, thank you for that. So the you know, position does a lot of different things. I'm just a sort of big picture task to, to make sure it's clear what it is. But the core thing which supports a lot of departments is the assessor's maps and zoning maps, where, you know, obviously there's change every year, so there's a fair amount of time spent in keeping those up to date. The fees that we charge for surveys that come in probably cover that portion of the time that, that he spends. Um, then there's a lot of work that we do supporting other departments. In essence, you know, sort of a department wants mapping services, and, and we provide those pieces. Um, all those those grants that Councilor Freeman Daniels talked about, most of those grants require some analysis to get to them. Um, you've all heard me come talk to you before about which projects do we make money for in terms of the housing world, which projects do we make money, which projects do we lose money. That's the analysis that, that lets us do that and lets us figure out the way those resources are used. And the importance of that position to the DPW. That's right, that's right. Again, we're doing this. So they have a, they have a GIS person as well, yep. but they're doing more applied work. We're doing the the, the core base data, which that they're using. And therefore, the enterprise fund kicks in. Okay. Thank you, Council LaBarge. Yes. Um, how long has that employee been in your office? 
stuff. You He's know, been there as long as I've been. At times yeah. for quite a long time. I remember everything I've ever done here, but I lose all track of time. You know, a dozen been years is my guess. Quite but, a long time. Yeah. And um, I did know that part of his position, which has not just happened, but he has been doing work for the Board of Public Works for a long period of time. And I want to thank you, Wayne, as a director and your employees. I mean, you have worked so hard of getting and going after grants to make what has been done here in our city of Northampton on the changes. So thank you. And thank you. Any other questions? Um, just to follow up on the point that Council Freeman Daniels was making, just to reemphasize the fact that as a state and federal government continue to advocate their commitment to uh, subsidizing and funding municipalities, we are left to um, departments aggressively seeking, and we've we'll talked to a number of departments, seeking and acquiring and getting the grants, which is actually state and federal money that may have come at some point in the form of a, a tax commitment from the, a revenue commitment from the communities, and now we're in a position where we actually literally have to create positions to solicit these, locate them, find, identify the best ones, the ones that create the greatest virtues, and again, uh, the two hundred fifty thousand dollar investment applied towards two and a quarter million annual return is pretty damn good, and and in fact, actually, your department is. Is, is better off than most departments in many respects in the, in the amount of revenue that you generate for the programs that you generate, and it's critical. And I, and I, and I keep thinking that, uh, based on at least public testimony, the disconnect the consultation was referring to, there's an enormous disconnect as to what, uh, what this funding means. It's, uh, we've been accused of being frivolous uh, with money as opposed to, you know, as we're talking about an override or we're talking about losing positions in, in the schools, and then make the corollary between the development of bike paths and the preservation of conservation land and open space, saying why are we investing in that when we're not investing in our schools? The fact is, is that this is the cards that have been dealt by the state and the federal government. They put in mandates. They also require us to uh, uh, solicit our funds from them in the form of grants. Uh, it's very difficult to budget according to grants, and it's it's our continual frustration to try and remind people that this money devoted to bike paths, uh, uh, riverfront parks, uh, things of that nature, are actually use it or lose it. If we don't get that money, it's not like we can reapportion it for something else. So you're, you're just actually a convenient foil right here for me to rant about that, so I, I appreciate you just sitting there patiently and, li and listening and nodding, but um, it's, it's an important point that we have to make over and over again. The extent of the state and federal government's commitment to us, as it diminishes, we are left with trying to at least get some commitment from them. Our investment in our state and federal taxes is back here reinvested in the community in real life. So thank you for your work towards that. Appreciate it. Uh, Councilor Carney? Uh, just a quick um, note that the city has a number of multi-member commissions and uh, boards, and those uh, committees, commissions, would really have a hard time functioning without the expert staff that your office provides, planning board, conservation commission. I mean, most of those folks um, you know, really do rely on that assistance in terms of understanding what mass general laws are and other regulations. And so um, people should, should know that uh, the planning board staff are not only here during the day, but often well into the evening hours or early morning hours at some uh, planning board meetings. So thank you for that. I should add, actually, let's go through items we do. Besides supporting boards and the funding of boards, part of what we look at is our task is sort of doing risk management for the city. So that you know, some boards really need that. You know, boards, particularly for permits, are very likely to have things appealed. And so that risk management to reduce our exposure is really important. You don't see that as a savings, but hopefully we get sued less. Uh, I'm afraid you're not done yet. Uh, Councillor Lavarge and then Councillor Casey. Wayne, uh, thank you. On your 2014 planned activities, uh -huh. which I'm very happy to see, about the Connecticut River Greenway Riverfront Park, can you talk about that? What's sure. The activity and with? you're all invited tomorrow at 3 o'clock for a big ceremony. No, I've got it written down. Um, so uh, tomorrow we'll be taking title to this land, 
uh, a generous donation from Lane Construction. And we have um, $400,000 from one of the state grants, $117,000 that's, that's not in this list, actually, because it may be buried in things, that was fundraised by Northampton Community Rowing, $190,000 from CPA. And so we'll be developing a park over the next six months that's there. Um, Mass West is going to be the contractor for the project. Um, and it will be, um, you know, earth movement is expensive. I never understand it. I'm sure some of you would understand more than I do. But it's, you know, it's shaping the site to the, the right site. We're not building a boathouse, yeah. but the site will be ready so that if Northampton Youth Community Rome is ready to build a boathouse, they can. We'll build a parking area, deal with wetlands mitigation, do a trail down to the water, uh, and do a ramp down to the water, uh, a little nature interpretation. So it becomes a really a park that's ready for people to use for car top of boats, for nature walks. May or may not have a boathouse later. That's more in Northampton. The boathouse in general, because we hear so much about the boathouse, how is that going to be done by the rowing? So, or a fundraiser? Right. They, they have a lease for the boathouse. They have a 99-year lease, and it's really up to them. Um, now, this goes back to washing the grants. Yeah. Now, if we find a grant tomorrow for $2 million, we may come back to council and say, would you accept this grant? And we could change the deal. But at this point, it's a private sector property. Thank you. Councilor Casey. Yeah, I just want to say that I'm awful glad that my email doesn't have a ringtone because many emails I get from you are at 11.30 at night or 5 in the morning. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Just one last thing. Where, where do you meet for, for the ceremony? So at the Lane Construction site, Damon Road, right when you go into the interstate, turn left past River Run, and then the fence has always been closed, will be open for tomorrow. Great. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. We're actually still ahead of schedule, so Pomerantz is up next, but we won't. Uh, we're going to hold off because he's scheduled for, uh, for 7 o'clock. And uh, we want to stay going to... Let's go. So actually, have a, we have another break until seven. So if uh, counselors wish to partake in that, uh, just please be back before seven pronto. Thank you. Okay, we're back. My bad. I said seven promptly, and then I'm gonna let the show up. Not fair. The, uh, welcome back. We're out of recess. The city council uh, budget hearings for. Thursday, May 30th. Uh, this is for the FY 2014 budget hearing. I'm City Council President Bill Dwight. Uh, next up on uh, the calendar here is Central Services Department, uh, page 48, please. And Dave Pomerantz is here to sing to the choir. <laughs> Thank you for coming, David. Now, what we've been doing is giving the department has the opportunity to either uh, present a thumbnail or sure. to just open up the questions, whatever, what's your druthers? All right. Well, let me, let me just, so first of all, good to see everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to stop by. Good evening, Mayor Susan. Um, just a couple of uh, sort of quick facts, and then I want to talk about some personnel uh, notes and some uh, O&M things on the uh, both parking maintenance and the central services side. Um, with the recent addition of the 30,000 square foot new police station, uh, which is really a gem in the, in the city's uh, facilities infrastructure right now, and the uh, 50,000 square foot uh, two-level uh, parking deck that's going to be coming online uh, very soon, um, I thought it would be interesting to add up how many square feet at this point um, does the city actually take care of and is responsible for in city facilities, and I'm adding the schools to this. We're just shy of a million square feet um, with uh, about 10 staff on the city side and maybe 40 staff on the school side. Uh, and I ran some numbers looking at comparisons for facilities directors associations uh, as far as uh, number of employees taking care of square footage. And it's pretty amazing that, uh, like so many other things, you know, we could always use more. But uh, for the number of staff that we have taking care of our facilities, what our budget numbers are, um, we've got some amazing looking and well-preserved facilities and, and buildings throughout the city. So uh, I was even surprised when I came up with the almost a million square foot number. A um, couple of notes on the personnel side, you'll see, uh, on the uh, central services budget. 
Um, last year we added one and a half new custodians to take care of second shift services with the new police station. Um, that was the first year we had done that, obviously, and that is continuing. Uh, having those additional one and a half people provides uh, us the sort of cushion uh, and the extra hands and energy to keep that 24-7 facility clean, stocked, uh, and, and maintained. Um, as, as a uh, nod to Chief Sankowitz and his command staff, uh, I have to say that since the uh, PD moved in, uh, stellar job on, on internal maintenance by their staff, and uh, it definitely helps us do our job, uh, knowing that all their officers and, and command staff are doing as well a job as, as they are. Um, also last year, uh, Chris Mason, the Energy and Sustainability Officer, was working 30 hours a week. We bumped him to 35 hours a week. That will continue again this fiscal year. We signed a memorandum of understanding with the Northampton Housing Authority, and Chris is providing up to, <coughs> excuse me, up to five hours a week in technical support to NHA, uh, helping them develop uh, energy conservation and renewable technology projects. Uh, and uh, John Hyde is more than, more than happy to have Chris's expertise and those five hours a week. Uh, so he's built into the budget for an additional five hours this, this year as, is, as was last year. Um, you may see city staff walking around in brand new uniforms. Um, the city employees are members of the name union, DPW union, and we have just gone to a new employee uniform policy program. Um, we're waiting on t-shirts for the summer months, but uh, across the board, the, uh, the crew likes them. Uh, it's been a real morale booster. Uh, it definitely increases the safety factor as far as who these people are walking in and out of buildings on a daily basis, and it preserves their own personal clothing uh, from getting ripped, shredded, torn, uh, having things spilled on it. So, so far, at least on the city side, uh, the crew really likes it. Uh, come July 1, we're going to expand the uniform program to include the mail courier, the city electrician, the HVAC tech, and the parking maintenance staff. Um, so uh, a real plus, and I thank Susan and the mayor for uh, funding that and uh, making that a reality. And uh, it, it, it really goes a far distance to uh, help the crews and, uh, and the work that they do in the city. Um, just as a, as a note, you may see in the budget, uh, as a reminder, uh, we have central services staff, specifically the facilities project coordinator, uh, the city electrician, the HVAC tech, and the mail courier, who are all funded under this uh, sort of a multi-department contribution system uh, between Smith Folk, the DPW, Northampton Public Schools, and the city. Uh, that's a long-standing relationship. Uh, I inherited that when I got here six years ago. Um, and the numbers get tweaked here and there depending on a uh, bigger picture of who's working where. But, uh, uh, you know, the city electrician and the HVAC tech do spend a fair amount of time uh, both at NPS and the DPW. Um, I think uh, Jim Malo still likes to go down to that wastewater treatment plant and fix those pumps, <laughs> which is why we got them uniforms. A um, couple of comments on the O&M, the operations and maintenance side. Um, on the utilities side of things, uh, we have finished construction uh, with Con Edison on the six and a half million dollar energy performance contract. We are into what's called measurement and verification, uh, where they are now responsible for coming back and measuring to see if, in fact, we are meeting the estimates that they came up with for energy savings. And on sort of going from general to specific, on a general level, uh, across the board for all energy units, so electricity, natural gas, uh, those are our big users. We are seeing reductions, all city facilities and schools and DPW facilities, 25 plus percent uh, as a result of the technical and the technology rather and the hardware measures that were introduced. Um, Chris Mason is now developing a program. We had a meeting with the mayor about this uh, to look at that sort of third leg of the stool as far as how we save more energy, and that is behavior modifications. Uh, there's a whole program that Chris is developing to go amongst departments uh, across the city and in the schools to start talking about what else can we do, whether it's turning off the computers before you leave to changing how we 
we deal with requests for turning on the AC systems or reducing the air damper systems in buildings. Just to let people understand, there are more things we can do. But 25% average across the board is what we were looking at as savings since we implemented the project uh, just about a year and a half ago. Now what that means is we're saving because of the Con Ed project. We're also saving, uh, and this is certainly music for Susan, we're saving money because uh, we also have great energy contracts. Uh, because of natural gas prices, we're locked into some great pricing right now on natural gas. We're going out right now, bids are due next week for uh, new electricity contracts for our street lights, uh, pump stations, and some of our bigger buildings. And uh, the initial numbers we've gotten back, uh, while we're not going to see this, the uh, 0.589 cents per kilowatt hour that we saw in the last contract for that swath of accounts, uh, we're still seeing some really good numbers and some competition amongst the seven suppliers that, in fact, are giving us numbers. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is between natural gas and electricity, we used to, the city used to rely heavily on oil. Uh, with the disposition of the Florence Grammar School pretty much assured now, that was the last big oil consumer on the city side. Uh, no schools have, have been burning oil for a number of years. With the exception of a couple of small greenhouses uh, at Smith Volk, there are no facilities in the city now using oil. Uh, so that helps us as far as uh, reduce supply demand as well as lower costs for natural gas versus oil. And in fact, over the next three weeks, we'll be taking out uh, a dozen above ground tanks in the buildings and probably five or six thousand to three thousand gallon underground storage tanks uh, over the next three weeks or so. So you'll see, you'll see that happening around the city. A um, couple of other notes, um, trash hauling. Obviously the landfall, landfill is closed. Uh, for years, we've worked with a local hauler for taking out uh, trash from the city buildings at reduced cost and recycling for free, and the schools were done at no cost. That was a long-term arrangement between the local hauler and the city. Uh, Ned Huntley and I did a bid proposal, and we opened bids at the end of last week for trash hauling services both for the schools and the city buildings. Ned is currently putting all that in a spreadsheet. Uh, we have five. We had five bidders submit proposals, so that's always healthy as far as competition. And uh, Ned and I will be meeting next week to talk about structuring a contract based on who the apparent low bidder was. Uh, but that's going to take effect July 1. Uh, we currently have a contract with that local hauler for the city buildings, and they're still honoring the schools. Uh, but come July 1, it's a different ball game as far as the schools having to pay as well um, because of the situation at the landfill. Um, briefly, you know, you've heard me mention in the past about contracted and inspection services. This is the array of uh, both preventative maintenance and code-related inspections and exams that we need to do throughout the city uh, on an annual basis. Everything from elevators to sprinkler systems to fire extinguishers to uh, generators. Uh, some are required by code to be done. That gets built into the budget every year. Uh, and those are contracts that we enter into various vendors and suppliers on an annual basis. That will continue. Um, on, as far as elevators are concerned, obviously we all know about the state's, uh, I guess I would call it tardiness, in uh, doing their annual inspections. Mm -hmm. Even though you may see an elevator with an expired certificate, uh, Bridge Street is out of compliance right now, theoretically, because their certificate was up in March. I have about seven buildings that will come due June 13th, uh, when they go out of compliance. As long as the uh, elevator maintenance company who does our service work and emergency repairs has filed all the paperwork to request that inspection from the state, uh, we're covered. So it doesn't mean it's an unsafe elevator. It doesn't mean the state's going to come in and shut us down. It's just the fact that you know they were supposed to put more money into this program to basically add more inspectors in Western Mass, and it never happened. So we're relying on a limited staff to come out and do inspections when they can. Councilor. Uh, but I, I, you, you did not mean to indicate that they are unsafe either. No. No. Okay. All, the what, what? all the preventative maintenance exams, which we do on a quarterly basis, four times a year, they're up to, up to date. Um, and any repairs we need to make are up to date. It's just the annual inspection from the state. Um, 
One other note I just want to make under O&M, uh, operations and maintenance, uh, obviously the, the central services staff on the city side and the school side, um, daily you'll see them in buildings doing the small repairs, the uh, you know little maintenance upgrades here and there, uh, things you typically expect maintenance staff to take care of. I have the, uh, the pleasure, really, uh, and it is a luxury, but the pleasure of having maintenance staff on both the city and the school side most of whom now carry construction supervisor's licenses. And what that means for us and the city is that we can handle more and more large projects. Uh, we do the work in-house, uh, take care of all the permitting and inspections on our own, uh, bring in outside vendors as we need them, but we are acting as our general contractors. We're not paying prevailing wages. This is done during normal work hours, and it allows us to basically save money and put that money into additional projects. Uh, if you've been in the HR offices over Memorial lately, you've seen the place is pretty much turned upside down. We're dividing that space in half. New offices and uh, HR will be on the parking lot side, and Veterans is going to occupy the park side. And we should be done with that in a couple of weeks. Uh, but, you know, really a tip of the hat to the, uh, the maintenance staff, um, all, all licensed construction supervisors, which really makes Louis Hasbrook happy. Um, the, and just one other note under O&M, and I just want to mention parking for a second. Uh, we initiated a centralized office supply purchasing program, a centralized copier installation and maintenance program, both about four years ago. We've just upgraded all the copiers in the city to new five-year leases. Uh, no maintenance charges for the first three years on those. And so the machines are they're faster, they're smarter, they do more tricks. Uh, the next step is going to be to try to reduce the number of printers in offices because everything can be printed, scanned, emailed, et cetera, to and from these copiers right now. Um, the centralized office supply, and I mentioned the custodial program. Uh, we coordinate both the schools and the city side purchases on an annual basis. We order everything up front over the summer, and then as departments request things, we basically distribute them through our storeroom. Uh, across the city on an annual basis, saving a lot of money. Uh, so those are two big programs that have definitely proven their worth uh, in the four plus years since we initiated them. Uh, just briefly on capital, uh, this summer we'll be replacing part of the roof at the Academy of Music. Uh, we're going to, using CPA money, we're going to be doing the trim over and stucco restoration work on City Hall. Uh, it's an interesting exercise right now. The architect and engineer we're working with are trying to determine uh, what the history is of the stucco on the building. It looks like it was definitely replaced in the 20s. Um, and we're trying to verify the colors uh, to be as historically true as we can. Uh, we did some roof work on the building a couple of weeks ago. You saw the lifts and outside the building. Uh, we'll be doing an ADA access project in Muni later this summer, early fall, uh, so we'll have ADA access in the council chambers. Um, and we'll be doing a campus-wide security system in these three buildings. Uh, too many keys floating around the city. And we're going to be going to a FOB system, similar to what we use in the schools and what is used at the PD. Um, just a couple of notes on parking maintenance. Uh, it was about a year ago that Central Services took over parking maintenance. Uh, so that include, at that point, included the garage, uh, all the lots and the meters, uh, the pay stations. And in the year that we've taken it over, I think we've made great strides in you know, sort of fostering that coordination, better coordination and communication, certainly, between us, parking, and DPW as far as sharing resources. Um, keep in mind that the parking maintenance staff, besides taking care of the lots and the meters and collecting all the money three times a week, uh, is also the point group that takes care of those requests we get for closing off lots for special events that people want to do in the city. Um, there's a pedal poker run at the Maplewood Shops in October. There's uh, a blood drive on uh, United Bank's property in beginning of June, and they, they need seven spaces. Um, so things like that, that, that parking does, uh, besides all the maintenance work. I mentioned earlier that we're just bringing on the new uh, multi-level parking deck next to the PD. We've got some punch list items left that the contractor needs to address in that. Uh, and I've been working with the mayor and the chief of police as far as, uh, and the TPC, as far as looking at when we're going to open it up, 
and what to, what we'll do as far as charging uh, for those those 50, 54 spaces. Uh, again, remember, court employees and, and HCOG have that lower level between 7 a.m. and 5 p.m., but it's open after that, and we're working on getting that open to the public. Um, and again, on the capital side for parking maintenance, uh, bids are due on the 13th. We're doing an extensive uh, restoration and upgrade project on the GAR garage. Um, uh, extensive work dealing with concrete and epoxy repairs, uh, rebuilding uh, stair systems, uh, new rails, hair, uh, metal pans for risers and treads, uh, painting work, and that'll all start uh, probably after July 4th and run through mid-September. So there'll be times over the summer where we're going to segregate and close off certain sections of the garage. Um, so it's, it'll be a dance, uh, but these contractors do this, so they know what, what the owner expects and they want to satisfy the owner's needs. But there's, you know, there's a lot of deferred maintenance in that building, and uh, I've been working with a consultant on basically coming up with a four-year maintenance program. The first year is going to be the really big push with the big items, the epoxy work, uh, expansion joints, the columns, uh, concrete work on the stairs, metal fabrication, things like that. Um, and also later on, and we'll look at some elevator upgrades, et cetera, as we, as we go forward. Um, that's, that's about it. Uh, oh, one other thing on parking. Um, we are going to be, once we get this project moving in the garage, uh, we're going to be working to issue an RFP for a group to look at the, everything from sort of parking philosophy, parking policy, and technology in the city. The system in the garage is outdated. It was state-of-the-art when it was put in. Uh, the green pay-to-park machines, they're older. Uh, there are other systems and, and styles out there now. Uh, one thing we want to look at is debit cards for meters. Um, we had a brief discussion about this at the last TPC meeting, and that will be you know, some of the things we want to look at. So policy, philosophy, zones, schedules, as well as the technology as we start moving forward, but I want to get the garage project off the ground uh, and then we'll start shifting and looking at the technology. That's about it. <laughs> questions? Uh, questions, <laughs> consultation, and Council Lombardi? The, uh, the maintenance per personnel in the police station, that was anticipated, is that correct? Correct. You had that all figured, you had that, that figured in. And the 25% reduction in energy since the completion of the ESCO, uh, is that there? There haven't come up with a report yet as to what we've saved. Is that correct? Correct. They, they've had. We've been working with them. They come out with a, a draft report that looks at units saved. We're taking those reports and converting them into numbers. They're guaranteeing us what we should be saving. And now we're going back and looking at building by building, systems by systems in each building to see where are we short, and working with them to say why. Um, is it technology? Is it uh, the software for the energy management system? Uh, is it uh, staff leaving the windows open or cranking up the heat beyond what we have it set for through the computer system? Okay. And do you have crossover <coughs> in your personnel? I mean, you have it listed here as parking, uh, central services, and then you have central services parking maintenance. Do they back and forth? Not officially. Um, we will, I will. I know it's impossible not to, to, right. to, some, to some degree. For example, if central services and maintenance staff needs equipment for something, we'll pull it from parking. Okay. If the parking staff needs manpower for assistance with something, we'll shift the uh, maintenance staff over to do that. Um, but, but also let me, let me expand that and say we do that with the DPW and they do that with us. So, for example, if we need some assistance with the tree truck or the bucket truck, we'll call the DPW. Vice versa, if they need something in their admin building that is sort of beyond what would be expected the HVAC tech or the electrician would do, maintenance staff will go up and help them with that. So there is, it's not an official relationship, but you know, we certainly share resources as much as we can. And, that, and I would hope that you felt that you had that flexibility to do that. Absolutely. Okay. Um, what was the, the name of the firm? I had given you a report that was put together many years ago for a parking maintenance program for the garage. 
Is that are you using the same firm for this report or this plan? Um, it's not ringing a bell. Uh, what, what the, I've never seen a report. Okay. Uh, if there if there was if there is in the records uh, when I took over all the files I never found anything. Okay, I have a of copy that of that nature. And um, anyway, I just kind of wonder if it was the same firm or not. I don't know. We paid five thousand bucks for a report and had a five year plan. It had year one, year two, year hmm. three, year four, year five. I know it's obsolete now. Christ, I think it's eight years old. Right. Different priorities. Yeah. So so we have a new a whole new plan coming. So it's not the same plan. Correct. Okay. And we. We were touching on another department last night, which was the Council on Aging, mm -hmm. and the director indicated to us, uh, I, I looked at the rental that was pretty anemic, I thought it was not, it was pretty low, the 2650 bucks or something, and she had mentioned it was the HVAC and she could not, and I asked what it might be that would be turning people away, and she said because she couldn't provide or guarantee them heat or air conditioning. And I know that when it was first built, the geothermal mm -hmm. uh, wells, they, of course they have pumps and then they have manifolds, and the manifolds were, I think they were substandard because they had developed hairline cracks, they sucked air, Correct. and the system was not working correctly. I remember that very well. Right. But they've been replaced, and apparently now they're not, for some reason or another, they're not functioning. We and she indicated that to us last night. That's why I, I was dumbfounded. I, I, yeah. We get schedules from the COA of when they've got events in the different rooms. So, for example, the Hampshire Coral Society, or they're renting the space out for a workshop from an outside vendor. Um, so we set, whether it's cooling or heating, uh, my staff will set, based on the outside weather, what we need for schedules. Now, if it's a cooling situation, let's say the event's from 6 to 9 p.m., we're going to basically put the cooling on at probably 5 o'clock, and start ramping it down at 8 o'clock. So that could be some of the, so the up and down that they're sensing. Um, I will ask Jason uh, if he gets any complaints from COA staff, um, but normally he's going to tell me if we've got an issue with those systems. And to answer the other part about the uh, heat pumps and what happened, the manufacturer and the contractor came in, it was a, man, it was a product liability issue, it was a manufacturing defect. And all the, and a lot of those parts, the compressors were replaced at no cost to the city. And we run the system runs fine. So there could be some tweaks, or there could be parts on the, the shoulder sit period where you know the AC is ramping up where it's going down. I, I'll have to call Patty and ask her, and I will also ask Jason. Yeah. Okay. But she she indicated that she she couldn't guarantee, and she said it was it just turned people away. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, that's why I'm asking, and I would really like to definitely look into we'll definitely look into it. Too nice a facility to let go unused. Right. Um, I really thought when I saw that low number uh, for the rental, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Hmm. Twenty-six hundred bucks for that facility for a year. Right. Yeah. Okay. Council of Arms, you have a question. Thank you, um, David. I want to thank you and your employees. I really like the direction that you're going into of running central services. I like the idea of the employees being hired who are licensed contractors, which is saving money for the city to go on the outside. So I want to thank you and all your employees. Thank you. Uh, I just have a question about um, this is a trash removal. That's $18,000. That's what you budgeted. That's for that's city buildings, yes. And then the school will be the school schools, will be um, we're estimating about thirty thousand for the school. And that won't be that's not here in the budget. That's gonna come in that's gonna be on the school side. It's that's on NTS, yes. Okay. Um, five hundred dollars for groundskeeping supplies. What grounds do central services deal with? I mean that's not a lot of flat flower beds. Oh, is that what it, it is a lot of small stuff? Yeah. We don't we don't the main staff actually takes care of all the, the grounds, so it could be everything from a belt for a mower to some fertilizer or grass seed. Um, not a lot of lawns and gardens in, in the downtown buildings. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I want to talk to you about that. Uh, so 
And then the other thing is the bid assessment, 35000 that's how it comes out of parking. Is that right? Yes. That's for the MOU that was that the city signed? That, that's correct. A couple of years ago. And that's, that's an annual arrangement uh, with, with a fee that goes to that. Yep. And it gets run through parking maintenance. Right. And then parking has... Um, is this right? Fifteen thousand for telephone and seven thousand for central services telephone. Is that right? Because that's just, I mean, it's just like this. This year, I just decided to look at the telephone bills for for different departments. It's like I'm just trying to figure them out. I guess. So. But maybe this is a question for the. Uh, the, the, the telephone line item is the um, Connect CTY. Right that the parking division uses to do the, um, you know, when there's snow and the lots are closed. Uh, okay. So that's that's the that's the bulk of that 15. So that, that 15, that's the reverse 911. Right. Okay. okay. Other questions? Um, is the, the fact that so will no longer be doing the gratis school waste management um, and in fact can you give us an estimate or maybe it's inappropriate based on the bids that you see what's the worst case scenario and the best case scenario do you have a sense of that um, the way that the way that RFP was written um, there were numerous lines and spreadsheets that each potential bidder had to fill out based on the size of a dumpster and a recycling bin by building. Uh, and all I can see is that spreadsheet at this point, and I can't give you the totals. Is it scary? Is what I'm actually trying to get to. No, I don't think so. Okay. so you budget, that's, that budget, you said, is about 30000 Last fall, we asked some vendors to, we said, look, here's, here's what we're currently generating by school for both trash and recycling. Give us a budget number for what it would cost if all of a sudden we needed for you to come in and start hauling it out. And it was averaging around 30000 So is that... Okay. And again, that's going to be on the NPS side. Right. I guess I'm... Then what's the trash removal on the parking side for 40000 Is that... Where that's, going? that's the pedal people contract okay. that we have the downtown. plus some additional that we do internally. That's all the downtown. Uh, Correct. Facility. That's the pedal people annual contract. Right. So then, so then, from the inside the buildings, 18, the courtesy uh, trash, or, or downtown is 40, and then another 30 for the for, for the uh, schools. schools. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Uh, I also want to add that, that another thing that tends to be overlooked is cost benefit analysis and investment and energy savings. And the retrofitting and, the, and even the proposed behavior modification that you're talking about, that the the, the investment in the technology and the investment in the, in the time and organization actually manifests as a, as a clearly a 25% savings is significant in, in consumption. And uh, that's um, the fact that this is a progressive and aggressive campaign is much to your credit. And, and the fact that you're you're hurting more cats than most people. And uh, you have, uh, I mean, I think uh, MIS was talking about this last night. It's essentially we have, we have, not, uh, we have data systems that don't coordinate with other departmental data systems. We have departmental cultures that necessarily uh, might be a little difficult trying to get them to conform to certain behavior patterns or, or productive behavior patterns. And I have to say, under your aegis, that you've done a remarkable job. And, and in fact, actually, it, it, what belies is that there's the, the political dimension of your job that's often overlooked frequently when hired, and I've experienced past uh, uh, directors in your department who have not been particularly politic or thoughtful about the political nature, and we have borne the consequences of that. And I, that's to your credit, it doesn't say anything, on, it's not in your job description, it's not in your resume, but it's a fact, it's a feature that actually figures pretty heavily in the, a very successful execution of, of, of coordinating this antique, cobbled together jerry rig system that we have and make it function like a modern system. And, and I just want to express my gratitude for that. So, 
Thank you. And I'll also you know, give credit where credit is due. You know, Pastor Mason is out there pumping the Bible all the time. <laughs> I, I know. He usually gets my head with it. So, uh, Council Chase. I, I, nothing about the budget or anything like that, but I just, I'm just going to spit it out anyway. I want to thank you for your attention to detail in the way you handle the department and your focus, which we haven't seen before you. in your department, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? All right. Time with us is done. As brief as it seems. Thank you, David. Thank, Thank you very you much. Good to see you. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, let's see, what time is it? We're at uh, we're 40. 40. 40. 40. Okay, so we're good. Next up, Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School, um, page 101 in your budget book. Who is coming to speak today for yeah, Smith Vocational? I think that's much. Superintendent is here. Yes, sir. Jeff Peterson. I'm the, uh, the new superintendent. I think I met most of you in the fall. Uh, also with me is Dave Tobin. He is a financial consultant and he works for the uh, Massachusetts Association of School Committees. And he does a lot of work like this, helping uh, school districts with their budgets. Uh, Nancy Roberts is our business manager. Uh, Mike Cahillane is a member of our board of trustees. And uh, John Cotton is the chairman of our board of trustees. Um, if I could start, I think I would like to tell you a little bit about the foundation budget and <clears throat> how, how, how the state comes up with um, the numbers that um, each school district must spend per pupil, all right? The, the Department of Elementary and Sec Secondary Education, they look at each town, they look at the tax rate, they look at the medium income, um, they look at the uh, property values, and they say that this city, Northampton, can spend X amount per child to send that child to Smith Vocational, okay? Um, that amount that the state comes up with, that's called the um, minimum contribution, the minimum local contribution. That is a number that the city, and every city in the Commonwealth, has to pay to their uh, school district, okay? Uh, they then take what is left over between the number that they think and the number that we were given, and they augment that by giving us Chapter 70 money, okay? So uh, in this situation, in, in FY13, if I could, the state uh, set the, the foundation budget here in Northampton at $2,229,442, which divided by 123 Northampton kids comes out to $18,125, okay? Um, How many Northampton kids? 123. They then said that we feel that the city of Northampton can afford to pay $1,757,745 to our school, all right? And that is for pupil services. I'm sorry, if you don't have it, I have copies. I thought you had it. Yep. I have copies if anybody needs them. Okay. So right now we're under FY13. Um, <clears throat> so in essence, the city was paying 14000 or should have paid $14,290 uh, per student that came to our school in this fiscal year, which is this school year, okay? Uh, the interesting fact is that we charge tuition to our sending districts, 15191 So the city gets a break of about $1,000 a kid to send a kid to our school. Um, going back five, five years, if I could, this required district contribution has fallen short to our school district in the amount of $2,112,354. So since fiscal year 2008, our school district has received $2 million less from the city of Northampton, which I don't think a lot of people know, but we have received $2 million less than uh, the city was legally obliged to give us. Now, when this number comes out in the, in the spring, uh, 
this required district contribution isn't a suggestion, it's a law. It has to be given by the city, okay? Um, fiscal year 13, the Northampton Public Schools received 111% of their required minimum contribution. We received 71% of our required contribution. Uh, the mayor and I did speak with Jeff Wolfson at the Department of El uh, Elementary and Secondary Education. He did make it clear to both of us that moving forward that the city would be responsible for the uh, required district contribution. All right. In the past, there has been an agreement between previous superintendents and previous mayors where uh, th there was extra money given for capital improvement projects or what have you. The mayor and I are both rather new, and, and I am hoping that we can come up with a similar arrangement moving forward. Um, because we do understand, we do understand that while we feel that the city is, is getting a discount, we feel that we can help the city save more money. But we want to do that. We want to have that conversation. And uh, looking at fiscal 14, the city is required to only give us one million six hundred and twenty three thousand dollars two hundred and twenty nine that is their only obligation to us now our budget is an eight million dollar budget but that all comes from tuition and grants from other towns this city is only being charged for the 106 fiscal 14 to this no, is fiscal year 14 I'm moving forward to fiscal 14 I'm sorry uh, one million six hundred and twenty three thousand two hundred and twenty nine Rather than writing that down, is that somewhere? It is. Yeah. So once again, this uh, this page was taken directly from the DESE website, and, and every city and every district has the same amount. And uh, the, the average statewide for uh, min minimum contributions, cities are paying about 120% of their minimum contribution. Um, like I said, Northampton is at 111. Our district is at 71%. So we're far below minimum contribution. And I, I think the biggest thing right now, we want to come back into compliance. And, and I, I want to make it clear that this 1.6 million figure isn't a suggestion from the state. It's a state mandate. And the DESE has already said that, um, if I can read from an email, recently Superintendent Peterson notified me that the school wished to withdraw its support for this accommodation. Accordingly, accordingly, I am advising the city and the school that Smith's net school spending requirement will be in full effect for fiscal year 14 and subsequent years. So that comes directly from the state of Massachusetts. Uh, and, and that was their ruling. Um, we would like to see that happen. We want to be in compliance. And, and like I said, it's not it's not something that we choose. If we don't believe in it, we can't pay that. We have to pay that. We have to get that money, all right? The city has proposed a total of 1.45, if I can find that here. <clears throat> they have proposed a budget for us of uh, 1,450,703, which is $172,000 less than the, than the legal state mandate says that, that they need to give us. So I'm just here asking that before you vote on this, understand that the legal amount in this budget, in our budget, is the 1.623229. And if that number doesn't get voted, it needs to, I guess. I've been talking to the Department of Revenue, and the Department of Revenue is talking with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And uh, there has been precedent set. Uh, if the city does not pay its full amount, um, the city, the following fiscal year, will be penalized that same amount in their Chapter 70 funding, which would mean $172,000 less to Northampton Public Schools. Also, in the fall, the city, uh, excuse me, the DOR would not certify the tax rate here in the city. Okay, so those are the two penalties that are on the table. So I'm asking when you vote for the uh, budget, please take in mind, uh, keep in mind that this 1.623 number is a legal state mandate and it can't be changed. If, uh, we're going to open up the questions and uh, just point out that yep. actually by charter we're not allowed to add on the right. budget, we can only subtract. Right. So 
I'm certainly not, I'm imagining not appealing to us to subtract. So right. we're going to open up the questions from Senator McCounsel Specter, then Councilor Schwartz, uh, and we'll start with yeah, that. I'm, I'm not sure whether the debate around this is, certainly I don't want to get into it because we're not, we, we haven't been involved in it sure. through all the details of this, but you make it sound very cut and dry. From what I understand, there's probably another side to this argument. I won't ask you to make that art, you know, sure. play devil's advocate and say the other side, but from my understanding, there are two sides in this. Okay. And um, so I understand you're making it very clear and the legal ramifications, but uh, from what I hear, there are, there are other there are other issues going on here. Okay. Um, so, but one of the things I want to raise is just this question about, because I'm sure you want to be a, you know, you're part of this community. Yes. Uh, I think you want to be a good probably. member of the community. I think you'd like to help out in any way you. that you can. And you probably know a lot more about this than I do. And you have a financial consultant here. But certainly one of the things going on nationwide and in the state of Massachusetts is the attempt to consolidate districts by working on a, uh, the economy of scale. So rather than having uh, two human resources directors, rather than having two people dealing with finances as best you can in districts to kind of draw those together. And regardless of whether that is the best way to go, because it may not be for other reasons, for sure. autonomy reasons or other, I just want to hear your, your thoughts about that, about trying to consolidate some of the costs so that we don't have multiple, if, if things can be done by both districts, right. Right. that it could save some costs. Now, right. again, I'm not talking about what philosophically sure. may be the best way, but just from a strictly financial viewpoint, yeah. um, what so, are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so the, the city of Northampton doesn't pay uh, one cent in salaries to anybody that works at this school. What they do is they yeah, pay... But you do. The tuition does. The yeah, tuition does. Right. Right, the, the tuition from the other... from right. the, It's in your budget. It's in our budget. Right. So but that doesn't come from the city of Northampton budget. Agreed. Uh, the $1.45 million goes to paying our indirect costs, which uh, does include employees' health benefits, and it includes uh, other items on Schedule 19, which I think Mr. Cotton would like to talk about in a moment. But... Uh, Can the, I this, just follow up then? Sure. I, I hear you. Yeah. But I go back to my first point of just... When the, the bigger district, the yep. Northampton School District, is in such dire straits, right. to be a good community member, yep. if there were ways to make those savings, yep. I understand that the city is not paying that, but you're paying that in your budget. Yep. And it's just a, you know, and Smith Volk is an incredibly valuable asset here, and I think this Thank community you. really appreciates right. it. Um, I think it's done a, a fantastic job, and I think it'll continue to do that. But I'm just saying, just in terms of public relations with the rest of the city where one district is suffering, if there's a way to save that kind of money, right. just from, again, philosophically, it may not be the best way for yeah. your school to go, but just strictly from a kind of business standpoint, what would be the argument against trying to consolidate some of those services? I know you're, the city is not paying that salary, right. but you have to pay that salary. Sure. So are we talking about the budget, or are we talking about merging today? Uh, what's the focus? Well, I'm talking about the budget. I'm talking okay. strictly on the budget, because I don't want to get into the philosophic side okay. of that or the legal side. I'm just so, getting your opinion. So we shouldn't really talk about, should we talk about the merger today, or should we do that another time, or, or should I think, we? I think the frame of the question is essentially the, uh, the essence of the question, without, yeah. without setting up, is that trying to determine whether the perceived redundancies would make sense to am amalgamate Thank and you. function as, as, as a city unit relative to a budget discussion, or an overall right. budget discussion. It may inform a conversation later on about possibly considering of the discussion going forward about consolidation. Okay. I think what the council is trying to get at is, do you think in a financial way, if it makes any sense to consider consolidating to eliminate redundancies? Uh, for, for you to function or manage a system, manage the system that you're charged with managing. Right. I'm unprepared to talk about that today, and I would love to talk about that in the Fair future. Enough. Yeah. Councilor Schwartz. Uh, well, I just um, thank you for being here. Appreciate your perspective, and I feel uncomfortable hearing it without. Um, uh, you, you've, you've made some some strong statements about this legal mandate and the, North, and the city of Northampton is violating that mandate. And I feel uncomfortable hearing that without giving an opportunity for the mayor who's here to just mm -hmm. 
uh, respond to that and without necessarily going into a full-fledged debate, but, but I feel like I want all, to all hear a response to what you just said no. because I need to get better informed. I, I, the mayor, I think that's directed at you, so if you want to respond. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Have you just the microphone? Um. Uh, where do I begin? Uh. So uh, there's a reference to a letter from Mr. Wolfson, who's the um, uh, undersecretary for the Department of uh, Elementary and Secondary Education. Who, yes, we have been in touch with. Um. I guess the best way to describe this is, and I think I've said this publicly. Uh, Smith Vocational is unique in many ways, and that's all great, but especially the way that, it's, uh, that it fits into the funding formula for, um, for our public schools in Massachusetts. Um, it, it really was not envisioned when Chapter 70 was written. It doesn't fit into, uh, if you actually read the language, and we've had, we've had legal discussions with about them about their interpretation of even Chapter 70. Um, because what's happening here is there's a, uh, an application of a, this so-called net school spending formula to, we have, we're the only community in the state that has two uh, net school spending formulas um, because they, they, are, they recognize that we have two districts, although we have actually two local schools. Um, so, in and the other piece of this is that most of the, the other communities are paying a set tuition, you know, uh, a set tuition, and, uh, and the city of Northampton is absorbing not only um, the, the cost of our educating our kids, the normal cost of educating our kids, but we're also paying for all the capital expenses. Um, we're also paying for uh, uh, things like, you know, retiree health insurance, a number of other things uh, that, we, that we pay for um, that don't get reflected in that. So the reference to the previous agreement uh, was really, frankly, a recognition on the state's part uh, that that formula didn't really quite fit. So they've been willing to look at, and I believe it's the right way to do it, is to look collectively at the entire city of Northampton and all the school children in Northampton and using a, a sort of a, a combined net school spending number, which has been, that's been the arrangement that was in place prior to that. Um, and so uh, this reference to, you know, five years ago, uh, five years of, of overdue money. There's no overdue money. The, the department, D.C., uh, blessed that agreement between the school and the city in recognition of the fact that we were, uh, that we were paying, um, you know, for all these additional costs that didn't get factored into the formula. So I've actually provided, I've put together a helpful one-page sheet that I can pass out uh, that can sort of show you what I believe are the costs um, in terms of what we're paying for. Uh, and I'd be happy to share that now, or we could talk about it later, whatever you'd like to do. Um, As you pass that out, um, would you speak to the liability that's being projected? Certainly. So uh, there's a, there, this issue, well, yeah, we, it's, I'm glad we actually have a consultant here, but it, there's been this long, there's been this debate that I've been having with the trustees uh, uh, and the superintendent about interpretation of what the net school number actually is. I actually believe the budget they've put before you doesn't meet net school spending either, um, but that's a side issue in terms of what the actual net school spending number is. Uh, we believe that, um, uh, we believe, again, we've had discussions with, um, with, with DC and their, and their legal staff about this. I mean, my approach is that we don't believe that that's a correct interpretation of net school spending, and I'm willing to challenge that, and we will if we have to. The liability piece of it would, have, would happen uh, when we got to the end of the fiscal year if we had not provided that so-called amount. <coughs> my, my plan, obviously, is to begin a discussion um, earlier than that, which I think I've signaled to the community. Um, what he didn't read was if you get to the end of that letter from Mr. Wolfson, Mr. Wolfson suggests that you know this has been a continuous issue and that we would really be interested in working with you to looking at a new system, a new model for the school, including merging it with the Northampton School District. That's how Mr. Wolfson closes his letter, um, as he closes other letters. Because again, if you look at the list of schools that the state has, they've got you know Acton through Yarmouth, all you know 351 local schools. Then they've got Smith School, 
by itself, and then they've got the regional schools. It's not a regional school, and it's really not a, a local city school district. It doesn't quite fit into either category, and they've kind of shoehorned it in. Um, because again, we're, we're the only town that's being applied, that the net school spending formula is being applied to. It's not being applied to all the other uh, communities that are participating. So there's a disparity in the funding that, that's happening, and, and the state has been willing to recognize that. So I, I can pass this out, and you can take a look at it, and we can talk about it. By the way, uh, as, as far as the microphone goes, there is no microphone. Step, uh, yeah. The microphone is on top of that camera. Did so I give you, oh, wait a second. I can give you uh, a step. Okay. And, and Mr. Peterson, you will have an opportunity to respond to that. Uh, uh, Councilor Schwartz is still... Well, I'm just wondering about what we're doing in this context for this 30-minute increment. I mean, as I, I and I really appreciate well, where we started. And well, I, I guess what I want to say is I've put forward a budget to you for this particular uh, department. Um, and uh, this particular department has voted a, a higher budget. I'm actually a trustee. I was on the board of trustees. I didn't vote for that budget. Um, and I believe in our legal counsel, we've had back and forth their legal counsel and our legal counsel uh, that they don't actually have a, uh, that they need, they're not an independent regional school district that gets to set its own appropriation level. So that's a debate we've been having. Um, so, but in terms of what I'm proposing for their budget, uh, and looking at the actual costs that we're paying, uh, what we've done is up above, I've got my proposed appropriation for Smith Folk uh, School, um, and it shows the various uh, pieces of that. Um, it shows um, the, uh, you know, the indirect cost that the superintendent was referring to, and that's, co that's a common, <laughs> that's a term that gets used for NPS and for Smith Folk. It, it's the things that when we talk about how we pay for health care for all the teachers on the, out of a city budget, that's not in the school budget, but they recognize that that's a cost to your education budget, that that's being paid that way, or, or other factors like that. Um, chapter 70, which is the money that comes to us for our, for our kids in Northampton, and then we receive from the Smith Charities this year, we're receiving $8,900 um, from the Smith Charities, which we also appropriate to them. So um, in terms of our expenditure uh, per Northampton student, we have sort of go across the line here, and we've, we've uh, played out. You know, I think what I'm going to actually do is I'm going to ask Susan to, to, to walk through this with me because she's the one who has updated this chart okay. today. Okay. Oh, sure. Copies to the, and also, you have extra copies? Yep. So this, this chart is not really a net school spending student per pupil cost. Not this based is, on that form. Right. This is, it is and it isn't. This is a look at what are we really spending? What dollars in the city budget are actually going towards Smith Oak? So as the mayor said, you have the indirect costs, and those are $1.4 million. That includes the insurance for the teachers, uh, the retirement assessment, because all of the non-teaching staff at Smith Folk are in our retirement system. It's a share of MIS because we provide MUNIS and, and computer um, networking to, to Smith Folk. It's a share of a number of, of things in the city that we can quantify, that the state allows us to quantify under the net school spending formula. So that indirect cost is a number that's related to net school spending. And for FY14, it's estimated at $1.4 And then there's the Chapter 70, and then there's Smith Charities. So what qualifies towards net school spending that we know we'll be spending in FY14 is $2.3 million. There's 106 students in the Smith Folk budget um, from Northampton for next year. So when you divide that out, it comes out to about 22197 per student. Then if you look below that, there's a number of costs that aren't included in net school spending that the state doesn't give us credit for in the net school spending formula. But these are costs that Northampton bears. And if we were a regional school district, these costs would be shared by all the member communities. They wouldn't be counted in net school spending, but all the member communities would be paying a portion of this. But because we're not a regional school, the other 40 communities do not have to contribute to any of the other costs. So what we don't get credit for in net school spending is retiree health insurance, which is about 200000 
We don't get credit for covering insurance uh, liability, building liability, vehicles for Smith Folk. That's a $30,000 expense. And then the debt service for all the capital improvements that we've done at Smith Folk over the years that we're currently paying debt service on. So that's another $371,000. This number, by the way, does not include the $150,000 that's going to be put into um, to one of the capital orders for the Building B boiler. So this number for 14 will actually be bigger when we update that. So when you add another $600,000 worth of costs, that's what Northampton is taking on that we're not sharing with the other communities that send their kids here. We have about 25% of the kids at Smith Vogue. If this was a regional school district, these costs would be most likely apportioned based on the percentage of students. So if we were a regional school, the other communities would be picking up about 75% of this. We'd be paying about 25%. But we pay 100%. So if you really want to come to a number about what Northampton actually spends at Smith Folk, you need to add that, that cost and divide it by the 106 students. So for each student, it comes up to about 5,800. So when you add that to what we're spending up above, the 22,197, then we spend another 5,813. We're spending about $28,000 per student to send the student, $28,000 per student for a, for a Smith Folk student. The tuition that is paid by the other municipalities, however, is set by the trustees. There's a maximum amount for um, that the state allows, and then the trustees are free to choose a, any other amount that's either that amount or less. They chose uh, a lower amount. It's 16200 So you can see Northampton, when you add it all together, and again, I, I want to qualify this by saying it's not just a net school spending calculation here. We're adding the capital costs. When you look at this, Northampton's paying about $11,000 more than East Hampton or Williamsburg or any other town that's sending their student to, to Smith Boak. Now, some of those towns may be sending students that are special ed, so we have to recognize the fact that um, those communities are assessed if the student is special ed. And that assessment um, for Smith Folk is 4,190. So a community that might be sending a student from another town would pay the 6,200 in FY14 and another 4,190 for SPED students. So when you add that in, and again, not all the students are SPED, but to make this a, try to make this a fair comparison, a, stu a student coming to Smith Oak that has special ed needs, would, their community would pay about 20000 so Northampton would be paying about $7,600 more per student than, than um, another community. And, you know, we, did look, we looked at Northampton Public Schools to make a comparison. Again, this is not an apples to oranges um, comparison because we all know that vocational ed costs more and that Northampton Public Schools is a K-12. through and as students age through the system, high school is the most expensive um, you know, level that you're educating kids at. So the number, it's not quite a really good comparison, but just you know, for fun, we kind of looked at what the numbers are for Northampton Public Schools. And again, the indirect costs that get counted in Northampton Public Schools net school spending is $4.4 million, then the Chapter 70 is $7 million, and then the additional appropriation is $17 uh, million. There's 2,765 students, so it's about 10,484 per student. And then below, I did the same kind of calculation, the stuff that Northampton Public Schools does not get to count in net school spending. And that's the retiree health insurance, the same thing, the vehicle building liability, the crossing guards, which is one category that isn't in Smith Folk, and then debt service. So if you look at the numbers, we're spending about 28 thousand dollars per student at Smith Folk are spending about 12 at Northampton Public Schools and again we all know vocational ed is is a more uh, more intense as far as money especially at the high school level so I just want to qualify that. But the reason why this act we do this exercise is to show that that, that the again the using that net just that net school spending formula in a vacuum not recognize and, and the state recognizes that, that this is a very unique situation uh, and so that's why they've been willing over the last several years to essentially recognize this and allow credit for all this other spending that we're doing at the school. And that's been the arrangement prior to uh, the new superintendent's arrival. He's now signaled that he wants to end that arrangement. Um, and, 
And again, this is a, uh, if you look at our actual, my proposed appropriation, you'll see uh, that they'll be, they're, they're, they will be experiencing an increase uh, in their budget. They'll be seeing an increase in FTEs and compare that with our other school, our, our primary school district, uh, where the reverse is true. Um, uh, and so that's sort of the, the backdrop of why I made the budget proposal that I did. Um, and again, we're in discussions with the state, and I'm actually, as, I, as I've made quite publicly clear, I intend to have a conversation about changing the structure, um, which even the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has recommended in letters dating back as far as when they were writing to Mayor Higgins about this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Council Schwartz. You saw before. Are you uh, good? Thank you very much. Other questions? No. Um, um, Mr. Superintendent, you want to come up? No, I'd like uh, Mr. Tobin to come on up. Um, Mr. Tobin, he, uh, okay. however, you're not. You're not, of course. Uh, uh, I think so. advising. Right? You're an advisor, so you're not actually a staff member. You're not. You're not representing. Okay. That's okay. Right. okay. Please, please. Uh, and that's why I'm here. Uh, my name is Dave Tobin. I'm a retired superintendent of schools for 22 years, but I retired quite a few years ago, and I've spent the last couple of decades um, advising school systems and different agencies about the school finance formula. It's an area that is my niche, and I work at it and live it. Um, I have to say this, I have been out three times uh, to Smith School and to Northampton on this very same issue. And uh, this is the third time. The first two times, an amicable agreement was achieved in our discussions. Um, I have enormous amount of respect uh, for the, the, the Smith School. It, it does an outstanding job, and I could sing its praises to you. It, uh, I can also sing the praises for the city of Northampton. I love the city. I come out as any time I can. The superintendent has me out every October to train area superintendents. They all love to come to Northampton too. I refer to it as as uh, that Cambridge. Cambridge is the Northampton of the East. That's that's well, except we'll, we'll let that go. Except yeah. it's it's very people friendly. And, and it's very evident in this community. So I have no vested interest in either one uh, of, of the two things. Smith School is a unique place, and the funding of Smith School is a unique contraption. Why do I say it's, it's a unique place? Uh, first of all, it's student body. Over 50% of the kids at Smith School are low-income kids. That brings greater money to the school district. Over 50% of the kids from Northampton, 52% of them to be exact, are low-income kids to come to Smith. This is their chance at secondary education. In the, founding for in the foundation formula, the amount of money for vocational students runs about $19,000 because of their low income population, because the vocational programs are so expensive, because they have a larger uh, number of uh, special needs kids uh, in their school districts. 40% uh, of the kids at Smith School are under a special education educational plan. Statewide, the percentage is 17%. So they're carrying more uh, than their load for that. And so the qu next question is, how are they doing with that? I mean, after all, the kids only spend half their time in academics. The other half of the time, they're in the shops. Okay. Well, they speak English in the shops. They write, keep reports. They calculate things. They take the academic content and apply it in the context of work and life and that is why 95% of the students who go to Smith Tech graduate in four years. 
96.2 of the students who have disabilities graduate from uh, Keefe Tech. I'd like to say that one again. Let's round it off. 93%. I mean, that's strong. I know there's a concern that I'm, I'm just sorry, uh, talking the case. A question that's okay. and, and by the way, I should say, as you, you are preaching to the choir here yes. about the value uh, of, of Smith Vocational. In fact, actually, you're going to find one of the strongest advocates for Smith Vocational right here who's going to trump you, in fact, in some respect. She, she can out, out, outsell the virtues of uh, Smith Vocational on that. And so, just, just so we're clear on that, and, and the purpose here, of course, is to, we're, we're trying to, we're trying to, this is the first time Smith Vocational has come before us in, in, a, in a long time, historically. And what we're trying to do is, in a time of fiscal crisis, which I think is not putting too much emphasis on the issue at hand. Mm -hmm. um, we are charged with reviewing the, the, the finances of every department. And this one, this actually was by invitation, uh, a request for invitation from the trustees. They asked for an opportunity to present that. And, and you're making a case for Smith Vocational to people who firmly believe in the mission and the, and the abilities of Smith Vocational. We're down to the really boring, soulless conversation about money and how we assign the money and how we deal with the money and how we allocate the money. And um, in, and I know, so if you'll allow us, the counselors will have some questions about that. And and, 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 and you're allowed to, you, you'll be certainly allowed to continue with your testimony, but Councilor Schwartz, Well, actually, my, my, my question was more the statement that you just said. Mm -hmm. So in, in other words, I guess I'm trying to keep us as, I, I have an instinct to want to try to focus the conversation because, again, I, I salute your summary of the value of Smith Folk and, and, and like Councillor Dwight said, there is, you don't need to convince us. It's, it's clearly a, a, an incredible asset to our community. So the question is this financing. I mean, I thought that you were getting, the superintendent was going to get up to respond to what the mayor had to say and, and if you're taking his place, so be it, but I would love to have us stay focused on the finance mechanisms and how we're, do, how we're doing as a budget matter. And, and I apologize. Because no, 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 I know what you said is true because there's evidence you always supported the schools. Okay. So let's just talk about the money differences. My interest is finding middle ground between two parties that have set the stake in the ground and are publicly discussing the differences. Middle ground is somewhere between $1,623,000 and $1,450,000 plus this plus that. Okay, and I believe sincerely, if people of goodwill who are interested in the continued success at the level that it has performed, work on it, and and that's what I would encourage. Uh, I believe if the two parties can come to an agreement, that the state will will say, all right, you're doing this. What each party is saying is a perspective. The state is saying the net school spending requirement has to be reached unless you can uh, do an accommodation. So that's, that's my pitch. There's another piece of that. The previous agreement included a compromise that was rational, had, was, could be related to the reality but also took into correct consideration the capital cost. Now, right now, there is approval from the School Building Assistance Bureau for a, uh, a, a needed renovation to the agricultural program, which is the foundation of the school, and science programs in the school uh, that has been put on hold Reimbursement for, let's imagine that that project were a $10 million project. There's 75% reimbursement that comes with that package from school building assistance. Now, I want to tell you, if you were doing something just with Northampton, it wouldn't be that 75% reimbursement. All right? So for a bond issue of, let's say, $2.5 million spread over 30 years, I would encourage folks to put that on the table at all, as well, in this discussion. So, 
with that, I, I, I encourage you to find an answer so that you can continue the success of the school. Thank you for your charge. I, right okay. now I have a question from Councilor Murphy, Councilor Specter, Councilor Pena. So, uh, as a consultant... I'm, don't call me a consultant. I'm, I think I'm here as a friend for both the as city as, and, and the Whatever school. role you play, it's with both. Sure. Whatever, whatever role that may be. Um, when, you, when you look at the mayor's proposal and grasp the scope of the other services the city of Northampton uniquely provides and the difference in net school spending, would you advise the superintendent of Smith vote to draw this line in the stand and say, I'm willing to perhaps compromise all the rest of the money the city of Northampton sends to Smith Oak over wanting the net school spending number to reflect what the state I think says I stated to you what I would say to both parties, because I just said it to both parties. Okay, so that, that is what I, I did say, sir. Um, I want to say that <coughs> 271 cities and towns do belong to regional vocational school districts. They meet all the net school spending standards of those, but in addition to that, they pay for the capital costs and transportation and so forth. So uh, that is what currently the, the performance, there are two recent studies. I encourage you to look at them. Um, uh, uh, one of them is done by the Beacon Institute relative to the effectiveness of the regional vocational model, and the other one is done by the Harvard, pardon me, Cambridge again, Harvard uh, 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 Graduate School of Education, uh, which is called uh, uh, Pathways to Prosperity, and it describes the model we talk, we're talking about. So, it, it, the, there, there are, we are, are we uh, just one other. Yep. Say that again. I'm talking about dollars. Yes. Okay. Same. The same way with the dollars. Those school districts, uh, the amount of money being spent per student at Smith, is about in the middle of the average for the regional vote tech schools in the state. You know what? I think, uh, uh, Superintendent, would you, uh, because yeah. clearly some of these are more uh, yeah. more red line, black line questions to be addressed yeah. to you, and I don't know. I'll allow Councilor Murphy still to yeah. have the yeah. the, 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 the house uh, yeah. yeah. uh, So my question really is, yeah. is in the context of this budget that's on our table for tonight, yeah. not whether the future merits support a regional school, the same system, or integrating right. Smith Oak in. We're talking about this budget. We're talking the difference between your budget and the mayor's budget, yeah. and the the line in the sand over foundation. And you seem to want foundation plus everything else mm -hmm. that we're already providing. Right. And what the mayor is saying is, no, we want to. You know, we expect to pay. A different number because of all of the other things we put in to support the school, which has been the tradition over the last couple of years. Right. Is so chapter 70 money isn't city of Northampton money. Chapter 70 money comes from the state. It goes to the city of Northampton, who in turn mails the check to us. So the problem there is the check goes to the city and then it comes to us. That chapter 70 money is earmarked for us. So that can't count in in the in the mayor's uh, uh, calculations. It can't because that's not their money. It's our money. The Smith Charities money, uh, but it's the truth. I'll give you the floor. I don't want you to yeah. I guess I'm back to Councilor Schwartz's yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> statement earlier that she's uncomfortable with the discussion. I, I've been on the council for a long time, and I think that this discussion is really about a negotiation right. that you're having with the city. In the past, any time the whole council with nine people starts to get all engaged in this, and there may not be a negotiation, but the topic itself, we're looking at a budget, we're looking at the mayor's budget, mm -hmm. and I understand your appeal to us, mm -hmm. and I think that's part of it. Sure. Um, last time at the council meeting, I believe the chair of the board came, and I think that was totally appropriate to appeal and make a public statement about where he stood on this. Somehow, though, to come here when we're doing the budget thing, I'm not sure we can be helpful here, and I'm not sure we're not going to just muddy this. We're also coming in in a very intricate process um, 
where I certainly, as best I can, I think I understand what's going on. But again, I don't feel I have all the information, nor should I. I don't think that's our place as a council right now because we've been handed the mayor's budget here, which is the budget that we can deal sure. with. That's what we have. We can't add anything. Right. So even if we wanted to, we can't turn around and say, you know what, we don't agree with you, Mr. Mayor. You know, there's an $85,000 difference here, and we're going to cut it so that we're, we think we should give Smith Volk back $60,000. Mm -hmm. We have no authority to do that. So therefore, I'm not sure what our discussion here tonight, we perhaps could schedule, because this is a long discussion, we may want to at some point schedule something the mayor thinks you should, the council president thinks we should, but I think this is a different discussion. So I bring that same yeah. discomfort here Excuse with me. us jumping in it. Excuse me. I'm going to respectfully disagree on one level. Mm -hmm. We have fiduciary responsibility yeah. that we were charged with, is to review, review dimensions of the budget. Now, by and large, we, we review and talk to departments on, on discretionary spending and allocations and capital investments and and all the other associated costs, because it is it is a responsibility borne by the community. Yes. And that's our job. Right. And to date, and actually when, it, when, the, when the trustees asked if they could be invited, I thought this was a, an appropriate venue to discuss our obligation, which uh, the superintendent is claiming our obligation is underfunded. The mayor is claiming our obligation right. is funded appropriately and perhaps to an extent, I think if we stay on that point, and, I, and this is my frustration, we stay on that point because the critical point, the, the discussion about the value of vocational school and vo vocational education is begging the question. And I want to, I want to stay on those points. Since it was directed to me, can I answer that? I agree with you. Yeah. I'm just not sure. I think we hear the two sides. Right. Well, I'm not sure where after that besides that you may be right, it can go somewhere, but I agree with you, we've heard the well, two arguments. Council Murphy's what question are we being asked was to asking do? the superintendent to reconcile the claims that the mayor laid out, and I think if, if you could address those points, yeah. um, and, and as you, you're, you're saying that the Chapter 70 obligations shouldn't count towards that calculus because Chapter 70 money is state-assigned money, yeah. but of course, as, as you'll recognize, of course, we also figured into the Northampton Public School System Chapter 70 as our, our portion of the state sure. give back yeah. on a community investment. Yeah. So it is, by extension, Councilor Tacey makes this argument over and over again, and he's absolutely right, that those are our tax dollars that we are also considering an oversight. So just so, yeah. and, I, and I think what happens is, and I think part of the problem that we're having here is there's a defensive posture assumed for, because of the conflict that's existing. Mm -hmm. And that's informing the rest of the conversation. But I really do think it's, in, it's incumbent upon us to stay on point, discussing <coughs> these particular numbers that are represented, which is this is a compelling case that's laid out here. Right. So, um, uh, and, and you may address that. I just want to make sure that Councilor Freeman Daniels is comfortable with uh, allowing the superintendent to speak to that, or do you have a question you want to add to that? You were up next, so. Well, I think Councillor Carney was. And my question, oh, I'm sorry. And, and you know, my, my questions are timeless, so. Uh, Always. <laughs> yes. And, and just, can I, since mine was the last question on the floor, because even though there might be this apostolic concept of, are we going to change this structure at some point, mm -hmm. we ain't doing it this year. We're dealing with this budget sure. now for FY14. Right. Whatever may happen down the road. Right. We're staying in bed together for 2014, right. pretty much just the way we are. So we got to kind of work this out for 2014. And then if there's a grander discussion about changing structure or not changing structure, it's going to happen later. So that being said, uh, and I agree, and I would like to have a conversation with everybody about how can how can we live together better uh, for fiscal 14. All right, the state of Massachusetts has mandated that the city has to give us 1.623 and the city is offering 1.45 now all the other capital improvement projects that, that, that don't count towards net school spending but they are paying acknowledged we need to discuss that we need to talk about that okay please keep in mind I'm a, I'm a, a first year superintendent and I'm trying to do what's best for both my students and, and the students of Northampton, okay? So rhetorically, why don't we just pay that and just deduct it from something else we're getting ready for? It's the same total dollar for us. 
Right. We give you your net school spending, and we say, okay, we'll just take it from here and right. call it net school spending. Right. So, so when the city pays net school spending to Northampton High School, all right, and uh, and I'm not sure what that number is. If they then want to put a new roof on the high school, that number doesn't come out of net school spending. Net school spending is it's kid money, it's student money. That is money to be spent on the pupils in their education. The buildings, the, the taxes on the vehicles, that's outside of net school spending. That's not money that's being directly spent on education. And we do acknowledge, listen, we do acknowledge that. We do acknowledge that going forward. I want to have a conversation with everybody about how can we do this better. Until the law changes, though, we have to go by it. Until the law changes, we have to abide by it. I will go to the state house with the mayor, and I will sit down with the Department of Second, uh, Elementary and Secondary Education, and, and I will come up, him and I, with a plan that works for everybody, that we can both sign on to. I promise you. But until that time, there's a legal obligation to pay us net school spending. Uh, Am I way off here? Thank you. Yeah, Councilor Carney was next, and she hasn't spoken. And then Councilor Casey. Uh, I'm, I'm just frustrated with, uh, with with this whole conversation. Um, with uh, well, with the whole piece of it, with looking at um, at the numbers in the book, with the fact of the discrepancy, um, with the the heated level that this, that this has risen to, and um, I understand that uh, Mr. Peterson, you're a new superintendent, and um, we know that uh, Mayor Narkowitz is in his um, second year working out an arrangement with Smith Folk, but I'm at least heartened by the, the comments that um, Mr. Tobin made about having come numerous times to the city and sat down with previous superintendents and mayors and come to a workable um, arrangement because we do have, you know, arguably the best folk school in the country. I mean, we see that we're now, I, I'm not going to get on, we all, we, all agree, we all agree with that. But I just would really like to bring, bring the level of um, emotionality down a few notches on this topic and try to... I mean, even as uh, Councillor Murphy alluded to, there must be a way that, even though, uh, Superintendent, you said that this is the obligation that must be met, and uh, Mayor, I see you kind of shaking your head saying no, no, no. I, we've done it in the past. We've done it, we've done it numerous times. In fact, this is the first year that we've not been able to do it in I don't know how many decades that the school has existed. I'm, I'm especially frustrated, too, by the last, um, you know, sometimes getting, uh, just getting sheets are them in and of themselves, I mean, they, they can be read a million ways, but it is apples and oranges to try to look at, at um, Northampton school, high school, or Northampton schools and the Vogue school, and it does, I mean, it, it, it's a different, it's a different form of education, and it costs considerably more for, for kids at the Vogue school level. That's the end of the stop for them. That's their post. They don't typically go on. Some go, may go on to a community college, but for most, it ends right there. And so, I don't know. I'm, I'm just hoping that we can. Uh, we, again, we can't do anything about this at this level. The, this right. body, this body can't do that. So I just well, want to see it brought down. What, and one other thing is so that if clearly we are one of the few public venues in which the conversation at some point can be spoken about. Uh, Councillor Casey, and then Councillor Labarge. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I just want everybody to go away thinking that we don't uh, realize that Smith School is a huge mm -hmm. asset. And I, I've said that a million times at these meetings. Mm -hmm. We drive by Smith School. I never take Smith School for granted. Mm -hmm. Never. Um, in 1942, my godfather had certificates of achievement at that time. There were no diplomas and from the welding division. And he ended up heading the welding division at Pratt Whitney Aircraft in Hartford in 1950, eight years later. So there's some huge success stories out of Smith School. We all realize that. Right. But in this new fiscal, we have to. We, we're just looking at this number at this point. This discussion about the structure and the administration and all this at Smith School is going to happen at a later date. Okay. And I would very much like to just focus on this period and 
move on because you're not going to find any bigger advocates than this council for Smith School. That's all I got to say about it. But we, we might, I'd like to focus on this. Okay, thank on, you. On yeah. the numbers before us. Uh, Council of Orange, you were next. And I do believe that Chapter 70 money is city money and is part of the funding formula. I, I want to echo what Council Casey just said about that on the Chapter 70 money. As long as I've been a city councilor, I have never, never seen this back and forth on the floor in finance going through a budget. And I'm not happy about what I saw tonight at all. And I think when it comes to a situation about walking through this door, coming into budget hearings, it wasn't the budget. Apparently there's a problem going on with the mayor, with you and the board of merging that school. And it, you came through this door with that on your shoulders. That's not what I'm here for tonight. I've been born and raised in this city and I want you to understand it as a superintendent, okay? I have many, many families who have graduated from Smith Vocational and it is one of the best schools. We need to get down to business. We have a budget to look at and approve for the mayor. Okay, so you need to understand, this is our mayor here. Not everybody is perfect, you're not perfect, but to outright come out and tell us, okay, that he is wrong about this or wrong about that, I don't like it. I don't like working like that. I have a job to do, and that's to get this budget done. Down the line, and I agree with my council president, I agree with Councillor Murphy, okay, that time will come when we will have a talk about what you are worried about. Okay. Because I think there's many, many people, but I'm not really happy about what occurred here tonight. Uh, Councillor Freeman Daniels, time for your time as well. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, I would like to know how we're going to bring this part of the discussion to a close because right. just because I, I do believe you're talking about our duty and I certainly respect our duty. I think we have to acknowledge the limits of how we can apply our duty under this circumstance yes. with a live debate that we are not in a position tonight to respond to with any foundation, any meaningful foundation. I think I think we have at least as far as Northampton's fiduciary responsibility of her from both sides relative to this and there's a conflict. Um, I would do both parties feel that they've made their case to its completion. The mayor does. So no, I don't it. actually. You don't? I have more information to think that. Do you want to do it at this time, or do sure. you want it? Yes, okay. we appreciate sure. that. And actually, uh, can, I, can I actually can I come yes. back into the mix? Then? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is only my second uh, budget hearing uh, or budget season. Um, first time I've, we've heard from Smith Vocational. Um, so what I what I'd really like to do is um, go with the take the take the budget that we have in front of us mm -hmm. and hear from um, from you, Mr. Superintendent, and uh, and from anyone else that you'd like to bring forward as to how you plan on working with the budget that, okay. that has been, been assigned to you. Um, and uh, I, I have, uh, I've given the, the mayor uh, a lot of praise and I, I'm not going to um, give him any more today because um, then it would just be taking up more time, even though I think he deserves it. Um, with the, his fiscal responsibility when it comes to the city. Um, and I, I don't think, and, and um, we will hear from him uh, in, the, in the future, and we'll hear from, from um, the Smith Vocation Middle and Agricultural High School in the future regarding exactly what Councilor Murphy talked about as, as a separate issue. And uh, so what I'd like to hear from, um, and maybe this is an attempt to redirect the discussion, is how you intend on, how, how you intend to, um, to work within the budget that you have presented to us and and what the sacrifices will be um, regarding this discrepancy which is you know about a hundred eighty thousand dollars and what the and what that will be um, in your 
for, from what you're working on? Well, in that case, I'm going to have to meet with the board and I'm going to have to meet with the business manager and the school principal and we're going to have to uh, reevaluate what we have, simply. Uh, do I know right now? I don't. I mean, I would have to communicate uh, w with the other stakeholders in that. Um, and, and, and I do apologize. I did, uh, as a budget hearing, wanted to uh, tell you my concerns on the budget. And I know that the conversation did take a, a turn towards um, the school takeover, which is not something that I intended on, so I do apologize for that. But it was my intention just to make everybody aware of, of the whole net school spending issue and, and, and where we stand on it, all right? So if I, if I offended anybody, I, I apologize. That wasn't my intent. Um, uh, so you had these numbers in front of you, and you, you didn't come here prepared at a budget hearing to tell us how you would tackle this number. Um, I believe. I mean, I find that I, I I just find it odd. These were the numbers that you had to look at. I just find it odd that you did not come here prepared to discuss your budget, just to discuss the amount of money that you're not getting. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is this is the end of the season. Uh, that's I, 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 have to, I have to echo that. That's what I'm saying. I'm a little surprised that um, that at this stage in the game, you you don't have a contingency as if, if what you're going to do if we if you don't get the additional money you're requesting. Mm -hmm. Why is that? I was planning on getting our uh, the, the legal mandate at 1.6. That's what I was planning. Uh, Council Murphy and Council Carney. Well, I, I can understand because. This is the first time they've been here. They've not gone through really through this process before. We see Smith Folk at capital improvements, which is yeah. something that you're used to doing all the time. Right. Um, and this budget, I'm assuming they looked at this budget hearing as a forum where we look at it as a, you know, let's deal with the budget that's in front of us. So I, I, I can excuse that misunderstanding because they have not come to this venue before and they came advocating a certain position. But at the same time, that doesn't change our role. I mean, really all we can do is approve the budget the mayor gave to us mm -hmm. or or cut it. So we can't actually do anything about your foundation question whatsoever. Or vote it down. Or vote it down. Um, we, we really can't deal with that. You know, what we've dealt with here is, you know, the police department telling us that the lack of money we're giving them is going to result without an override of losing four patrol officers. And our own school department's probably going to tell us without an override we're losing Six Eleven. FTEs, fifteen. Eleven. Eleven, Eleven. FTEs now in, in their schools. So that's, I guess, where the misunderstanding is. Is we've been dealing, you know, we we do this all the time and you don't. And yeah. we're just we're at a different place sure. than, than you are. But I, I want to say that at least I can understand that misunderstanding because you've not been here and gone through this right. process right. with us before. But I do commend you for asking to come. Thank you, <laughs> uh, Councilor Carn. Okay. Um, well, what we have is the budget. Well that was presented by the mayor, right, President Folk, is that correct? So these numbers that we see here is not the, is not the uh, budget that was prepared by the business manager in your office. The one that we're looking at in our book is a, is a different budget than what no. was voted on. It's the no. same budget that, than... than the, the budget that was voted on, was the one, there's one page in that document uh, that was the document that the trustees voted on. Uh, that's, that's different than the budget that I submitted to you, which would be reflected in the front of the revenue under the expenditure section of the budget. So are you saying that the, the budget, the, the number of pages that we see here, I, I just have a Yeah, so what we're looking at here is not the same as the one that you folks voted on, the Board of Trustees voted on. This one that we're looking at on page 101. That is the budget. That's the, the, the uh, page. I don't even know where. 101. 101 to 119. Yes. Well, it's 102. Well, I have, the, I have all the information page, here about Smith Boat that goes on and on. Page the 107. Page 107. Yeah. Yeah, page 107 was the budget. Uh, just 107.
407 is what the trustees were for presented to vote. Okay, but, so, but, but, but the business manager prepared all of these pages here. Right. After, after, after the fact, the they prepared this information. Okay. That's correct. But okay. that is not the budget that I have submitted to you. That's I put that in there for your information. The trustees voted a different budget than the budget so, that I have presented. So if we add up all the numbers that's in this budget here, and the, that we have in front of us, those would be um, $185,000 more. Than no, actually not. It's only, there's a, I mean, there's It would be different. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. 172. Uh, no, no, no. It's actually, it's about $80,000 Yeah. Okay. There's so what we dollars difference between what they voted and what my proposed budget is. Okay. So, uh, so we know that we're talking about approximately, we're talking about uh, on a $1 million, on a $1.4 million total? No, no, the, the total. Which I tried to tell them that night. Yes, eight million. So of the $8 million, of the $8 million budget, we're talking about a difference of 85000 approximately? What's that again? There's about an 80000 dollars And of an $8 million budget. And I should tell you that last year, they, the same incident occurred as well. They, were, they voted a budget higher than the budget. That I'm, I'm sorry, so we're talking about a, nine, about a difference of, a, of yeah. 1% approximately. Yeah. Okay. All right, so... We're laying off another FTE or two in the, in the NPS to fund that. So that's in a, in a budget that's seeing an increase in FTE. So if you look at the FTE... Well, I think it's a bit highly charged to... to <laughs> it's I, not I really highly do. charged. You're adding FTEs I and understand. you're getting a 6% increase. Yeah. In the reason I say budget. that it's highly tar we're, charged is... So the council has a floor. Okay, you know. the reason that I suggest it may be highly charged, and that's why I'm asking to, to ratchet this down a bit, is we're pitting, we're pitting districts against each other by saying mm -hmm. that with the difference of that the, the difference in one percent equals that we might as well say the name of the person who's going to be laid off in the Northampton Public Schools and say you know that's what I'm saying it's not it could be it could be a thousand dollars from eighty different locations you know there's a number there's a number of ways that it could it could actually equalize but with, the point is this is something that does need to be worked out I understand that you folks had a budget that you worked out that's ninety well, it's actually um, hundred and one percent or whatever that difference is different than the one that is approved or that's being given to us by the mayor and I understand that that of that eight thousand eighty thousand dollars you haven't gone through and shown this body where you expect to cut that eighty thousand dollars but I'll grant you as, as uh, Councillor Murphy did that this is the first time really that this hasn't hasn't been Negotiated and worked worked out in what a hundred years? I don't know, many decades, many many That's decades. That's not true because net school spending hasn't existed for a hundred years, so it's a creation well, of 1993, and it does okay. not apply to. Uh, doesn't apply 20 years to though. Vote. 20 years. I'm yeah. sorry. Excuse me. Absence of a gavel. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I was I, again, what I'm saying is that this is an extreme, uh, clearly a very heated issue, yeah. and I'm just asking if we can ratchet things sure. down a bit uh, on on both sides, please, yeah. because it's going it, it, when this gets out to the community, it's going to be equally heated, and we have to find a way to um, rationally deal with with this issue because it's it it, it has deep inroads into not just this community. But our ties to the Hilltown communities to has it has a, a strong impact. I agree. The um, actually I have a number of questions, but I'm going to let them lay. Um, but the, and they are fiduciary in a lot But uh, it's also about and when the uh, Northampton Public School superintendent came before us last year, for instance, uh, they, it, even before budgetary hearings, so what they did was he there was a request for level funding budgets. They presented instead to us a level funding budget, a, a level service budget, and then an optimal budget. It was not necessarily ideal, and I think it's a political tool. It, mm -hmm. it, it did create the divisions that, that Council Carney is referring to, that, that these things, because all budgets, particularly budgets that require cuts, budgets that require an override, are intrinsically um, informed by emotions because we're arguing over priorities and we're fighting over the scraps that we have left. And 
Um, I think that given the fact that Smith Vocational hasn't really been part of this before, that accounts for the fact that, that maybe you know going to the, the long guns right off probably wasn't the best option mm -hmm. in my counsel. The fact is, is that all departments, every department in the city, we've been treated and we've talked to, and we're speaking in the context of, of the pressures that are being put upon us by a substantial deficit. And this just speaks to what Councilor Freeman Daniels is saying, and I think what Councilor Schwartz is saying, that in, the, and Councilor Specter actually brought it up first, in that context, in a holistic perspective, this is our charge. Yep. We're looking at a holistic system, not parsing out department versus department unfortunate because that's unfortunately where most of the fights happen. People, departments fighting with other departments about who deserves what more or what. And the thing is, is actually what, we're, what I'm asking as, you, is, as this conversation goes forward, that we think about pulling oars together instead of smacking each other inside the boat, trying to figure out who gets uh, more money. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think uh, Council Freeman Daniels, you get to have the last word if you like. Yeah, actually. Uh, I, uh, I'd like to make a recommendation sure. that uh, we keep this portion of the hearing uh, open for the next for our next meeting. Um, the next council meeting. Our next budget hearing. We don't have one. This is it. Well, then we vote on it. We well, no, we don't vote on it yet. No, can we? It, we can convene. And by the way, I'm sorry. Well, we can yeah. schedule. We have two. But I'm just. My yeah. point is that um, the. Uh, superintendent indicated that he does want to return to his to his board and so on um, to deal with uh, to, to make a presentation and I think that the council because this is uh, this is their first presentation the council uh, should give them uh, um, a duo a, another chance at, okay. uh, at coming back and working within the confines of the mayor's uh, proposal um, so so I, and I would I would like to uh, see if we could could in fact have a uh, uh, the councilor is the councilor is asking I'll second for, that for the second. Um, so there's a second. May, may uh, ask, yes. May I ask a question? Does, how do you feel about that? I'll is do whatever you folks would like me to do. The suggestion is to come back, yep. present something within the confines of the mayor's budget, just mm -hmm. so we can understand. Sure. sure. Where would you know, like the sure. other department? Sure. Whatever you ask me to do, I'll do. Whatever you ask me to do, I'll do. That feels comfortable yep. to do. Absolutely. Councilor, would you be prepared to do that by next Thursday? Absolutely. Probably by tomorrow we'll be prepared to do it, but. Next what, are the, what are the dates we have, we can't, we can't do that. We have to advertise a public hearing and things like that. So this will be a new public Keep in mind, uh, next week is graduation and, and see how week. So, but whenever you want, I'll come on a Sunday morning. Next Thursday is the public hearing on the budget in total at council. Um, what are the notice requirements then? Uh, it's for the whole budget. It's right. They can come at you. You're doing a public hearing on the entire right. budget. Exactly. I don't see why it would be It's graduation. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's yeah. 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 not good. Um, Councilor, give me thoughts. You take two votes. Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> you do. And yeah. it's uh, you take, you, you keep the hearing open at the next Thursday's meeting for for the meeting for the for the budget hearings. I mean, we haven't heard from the um, regular NPS this year um, if, during our budget hearing process. So, I mean, that, that might be something that we could do at the same time. Yeah. No, no, no. Sure. Like, and, and that is just to keep in mind that under our new charter system, I mean, the school department has an elected body, uh -huh. the right. school committee, right. that makes all the budgetary decisions mm -hmm. within the number that the mayor and council give them. Yeah. That's that's yeah. their role. Mm -hmm. This council, that's not their role. No. And it's actually analogous to Smith Vocational. There's a board of trustees, which are three elected plus the mayor mm -hmm. and the superintendent of schools who make all the decisions within the, the line items of that budget that's voted on by the mayor and the city council. Okay. So I, I just want to if, if your objective is to get into a line item discussion of how things are being funded, that's fine, but I just want to, I want to make sure that those boundaries are understood right. around right. the charter and whose responsibility. To the, to the council's point yeah. is that we're actually pretty cognizant and made aware of the NPS, uh, what, what their budget response has been with the budget they've been presented. That is not the case with Smith Vocational. 
And I think that, and, and Councilor Schwartz has a good question about that. Well, I guess I, you know, just having heard, it, I was certainly clear about the NPA, the public school process, a la the school committee. Just hearing the mayor describe the parallel to the Smith Vogue process with the Board of Trustees, I, I do, I do question the our role in the context of the Smith Vogue budget and this councilor budget role, particularly in view of the of the politics of the moment. And I, I guess I, I, I question our role in this moment in the context of this school system and the, its decision-making process that already exists, parallel well, to ours. And I would, I would say that I think, um, in that we're keenly aware of the impacts, and as we're going forward in, 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 in the middle of a campaign, as you know, for an override possibly, that there's one kind of dark sky spot that we are not able to we the, essentially what's broken down for us we do not know the impact of the prescribed budget from the mayor we don't know the impact on this one department we do know the effect that it's going to have on the NPS it's going to or it's going to have on police what it's going to have on on the other departments have made their case I think for public informational purposes and our responsibility we should know what those impacts would be I think it's clear that it's not just from a, a, a practical standpoint, since it is graduation, since we're voting on this next week, and we we know it's about a one percent. We're, we're, we're saying not, it's we're a not little, voting on it. We're not voting on it, but, we, but that's yeah. when the hearing. Yeah. And given that we, we know that it's going to be a little under one percent, approximately one percent is the difference between the two budgets. Certainly, if you were to send, I mean, it's obviously something's going to, you have to look at this and say, here are some options of what we might have to cut. Sure. I certainly think that could be sent to us in a memo we could look at. I don't need, and that sure. we could all have that. I'm not sure, because yeah. if, if graduation wasn't happening, different story. But for the practicality and the shortness of time, you could send us something, we would all read it, we would understand, wow, well, they're going to have to go through some struggles sure. if they don't get this 1% as well. I have, I, excuse me. I guess I need to understand our role in this and that when you say you want to understand the struggles that they have to go through with the cut, I don't understand. We are not in a position of restoring We're not, money. but we're... We're not in a position... The override has no relationship Counselor? to the smith Vogue budget. Counselor? It has no relationship. I mean, as, as it's currently proposed. Except we, we've also heard from every other department. I think this was with the council president. Every other department comes in and has their opportunity to say in a public setting, this is what we're going to be looking at. If it's the police department, we're going to look at these cuts. If, and I think it's only fair, even though I agree with you on the technical, we're not allowed to restore anything. Don't, don't forget people with the police department. They can come in and say, we're cutting 40 officers. We can't suddenly say, well, we're going to shift money to the police department. So really what they're often making is a public case for their budget. And I think in that respect, I think we might want to just extend to them this, the same thing, saying, look, here's the budget that's been presented to you by the mayor. What are you, how are you going to... So yeah, it's conceptually off. It's conceptually off to me. It's not parallel. Yeah, um, I agree. If we make appropriations, we should be able to hear, hear from any from any department we make appropriations to, we should be able to hear from. And we make appropriations to so the most vocational and the school and the NPS. Can I say something? Sure. And I have to say this, and I respect the mayor, and we've had this conversation before. We have, the both of us, inherited a situation that I don't think either one of us are comfortable with, and, and we're trying to figure it out. And uh, as the superintendent of, of that district, that's my job to support everybody that's there, and they need to know that I support them. And, uh, and I know that the mayor has a different job, and, and, and his job is to run the city, and I get that. And we, we need to meet somewhere in the middle, okay? But this is something that, that we didn't make up. This is something that's been happening and we walked into. We're trying to figure it out. Well, as, as we all are mayor, and then I just don't want to be spoken for. Uh, I, was, I, I was comfortable with the situation. I, I, I was not the one who called the state and turned Northampton into the state. So... I was comfortable to continue the situation. So any any uh, to continue the arrangement that we had and that the state had blessed. I did not call the state. I did not notify the state. I did not do that. Uh, and uh, so I just want to make that clear on the record. Councilor Tacey, it, 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 it's like um, that, like everybody was like Groundhog and listening to Councilor Schwartz. This is exactly the obstacles and the issues that Mary Ford was trying to overcome. It's, it's like. It's like looking at Mary Ford sitting over here just talking away. It's exactly what she talked about. 
and uh, being not being able to overcome any of these obstacles because there was no place for it. There was no. We didn't have any. Uh, I, m I remember the arguments. Right. Uh, the the action the motion on the floor is for a continuation of the hearing. Mary uh, assured uh, is said that essentially this is an the, the six is an advertised meeting, and this is not advertised on that it, the agenda is continuation of this point. So we are left with. Uh, let me let me propose this. Give, I, I suspect the superintendent has an understanding of the charge that we're asking. If you could forward us a memo uh, describing uh, the impact of, of, of the, 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 the different numbers, that, or the mayor's proposal, if you could presume that as your budget and reflect to the council in, in a memo how that would impact your management of your school, then I think to, I'm sorry, Councilor Adams? Yeah, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. No, that's okay. I mean, just a sort of procedural question. I'm not, I'm not quite sure why, in addition to the, the public hearing we're having next Thursday, I know. Maybe why we couldn't have them. Just so that they can make, I appreciate the memo is a great idea. I just think that they may want to have the opportunity to show on, on TV the, the, the effects of, of um, staying within the parameters of the mayor's proposed budget. And I just don't know why the next week's agenda is not out yet. Well, my concern, I think Mary's concern, is it's, it's a publicly advertised meeting to, to, to discuss the budget in total, uh, where we, where the public is allowed to participate. At that point, if we are hung up on this one issue, um, and on top of which it doesn't meet, the, I don't think it meets the MGL advertisement standards because we have not specified with with a continuation of a hearing um, uh, on, from Smith Vocational. This is a separate meeting. This is a hearing, which is not, it's open to the public, but the public's not invited to participate. The budgetary hearing is a completely different creature. So I, um, and I may be wrong, but I like to err on the side of caution as far as particularly advertised meetings, match on the law, and the like. And I think, the reason I offer the, the request for a memo, I think in some part it addresses a number of things. It, it, it cuts out the emotional investment and discussion point. It actually direct numbers that we can uh, read and translate as we wish and allows us to review these things without the the, uh, the energy in the air, if you will, to speak in Northampton terms. Um, and so I think it serves the purpose of the questions that I'm hearing. It's asking, uh, uh, I've heard this uh, spoken by many councils with the exception of Councilor Schwartz, but what, I mean, I think Actually, on this one point, we were interested in knowing what the impacts would be, um, um, and if you could just lay those out, sure. um, and that would, I think, that would go a long way to satisfying at least this portion of the discussion. And as we all noted, all the other aspects and elements will be continued on, um, and I and I'm confident actually as we get through this, and it will come with no, it will come with drama. And it will come with some bad feelings at some level, but I think it also will also hopefully resolve some of the potential conflicts that we've seen looming and the ones that we're currently experiencing. So that, and, and I'd like you all to know that is our commitment, to see the same resolution that you desire. Not necessarily the same outcome, the same outcome being the, the best possible vocational school, that would be the case. But the fact is we're all pulling in the same direction. So that's our common ground, and I think we're in good shape in that respect. So if, uh, if you allow me, I, I actually think that, okay, Council um, Freeman Daniels. I'm looking at the charter. Um, I think it's, my reading of it is that it's, that we have to state the notice when we will um, let the budget be, op be, inspe be able to be inspected and um, when we're going to be having a public hearing on the proposed operating budget. Yeah. So I don't see any problem with continuing to discuss the uh, Smith Vocational This is a budget continuation at that, of a different meeting. Moment. You want us to convene earlier? No, I, I, I don't see. You I'm want sorry. to open it up in the, con reopen the table or yeah. postpone it and then open it up in the context of that uh, advertised budget hearing? Yeah, I don't see why why you can't. I, it doesn't, the, my reading of the charter does not preclude that. Okay. Well, there's a disagreement there, and if you'll allow me, I'd like to err on the side of caution here. Um, and so if, 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 if something is determined differently, then maybe we can do that. It is your, is it your pleasure to continue the meeting, or you're not, the memo that's, wouldn't That's my right? proposal. I understand. But, I'm but, but if, they, if they can't make it, want to send, send a, 
a, yeah. some, a memorandum, or if they, they just, if the, someone does not want to, if you know, if they want to send a representative, I, I don't have any. I, I hope that the council would allow a representative from the oh, from the high school yeah, to speak. It's part of the, yeah. No, I, I think. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Oh, actually, doesn't matter. The advertisement of the public hearing that's going to be next Thursday of the full budget had to be legally done yep. with a legal ad with plenty of notice, just like a poll petition or any of those, mm -hmm. with a certain number of days. You cannot just have another public hearing next Thursday. You don't have the, the timing. You don't have enough timing. Okay. I, I believe the minimum is 10 days. I see, I see 14 in the charter, but I don't see why we can't discuss the one element of this budget at the budget at the public hearing. Yeah. Okay, well, first of all, at 7.05, you're having a public hearing on the entire budget. You could have a, a room full of people who clear out and want to bring in another room full of people who want to be opponents or proponents. I, I don't understand when you're going to schedule okay. a hearing uh, for this. I, am, I intend to. I, I, ho I hope that we can, during our, let me, let me rephrase my motion. Sure. I hope that during our public hearing next Thursday that we um, allow for as much time and discussion on the Smith Vocational and our Agricultural High School as we can. Uh, that's, that's a proposal. I, uh, I actually, I think we need to vote on it. So, um, Councilor Tate. And the emphasis on how this will affect the kids, and I'm really not so concerned about admin and all this other, but how will this affect the kids? What will this do in reference to the kids at the school. Okay. That's that's my my big concern. Um, all right, that's the charge. Um, possibly also consider, um, I think, uh, an expanded conversation then about uh, tuition costs, tuition rates that were set for regional for regional in influence. I'd also like to understand um, the original question that was posed. If, if you're prepared to answer that about, that's more of a philosophical question about uh, redundant systems and how it might more effectively improve the lot of, of uh, Smith Vocational, if you think it will, if there were some redundancies that are actually enveloped in some aspect of the community. But that might be more appropriate for the larger conversation. But please consider it. Um, I think we've exhausted this and completed with being exhausted. Uh, I appreciate everyone's participation in the conversation here, and I, and I uh, appreciate the goodwill that everyone's expressed here and going forward that we continue to follow. Uh, thank you so much for your time and your testimony. I appreciate it. Councilors, there is actually an opportunity for discussion that's next on the agenda, um, but <laughs> uh, are we discussed out? What's, what's Councilors? Well, Councilor Schwartz. Can we move to adjourn? Second. Yeah. Can yeah. I move to adjourn? Yes, second. You got it. Well, you got it. Oh, second. second. Excuse me. Uh, would you, do you want to consider another meeting? Another yes. meeting? Because there are quite a few departments. I listed them in an email to Councilor Dwight that he sent to all of you yeah. that were not asked to come to these because we followed last year's agendas exactly. as far as who uh, counselors asked for last year. If you're asking for new departments to come to another budget hearing, I have June 11th or June 12th. Those are the only days where there aren't other meetings scheduled that we have, to, that all of you have to go to different meetings. And then the other thing of it is, is of these departments that were in that list, there's no guarantee they can come. For instance, dispatch, because we've only got a chance here at approximately two weeks to ask all these people if they even can arrange to come to something of another meeting. Mm -hmm. Personally, I'm not able to attend I I conflict. Right. Well, and, and the smaller departments, they there's not a lot of those smaller departments. There's not much you can do with them. There's two or three people. I mean, it is what it is. You, there's no change can really be made because it's two and a half people, <laughs> and it's all it, it's all personnel costs. I mean that whole other list, 
there's nothing there that anything can really be done with short of putting them out of business. Well, so that other list <laughs> did include the Northampton Public Schools. Mm -hmm. Just not to put too fine a point on it. Right. Just but, they're, but they're the only one that I was surprised we didn't see right. here. 62% of the budget. Uh, uh, Council Freeman Daniels and Council Levar. Uh, I think uh, if the Council can manage a quorum, we should have another meeting. Uh, I mean, Forbes Library, for instance, is, has, we've not heard from them. It's a $7 million budget. Uh, so I, I think that, like I said, if we can manage a quorum, then we should uh, hear from these other departments. Okay, and Council Um I have to disagree with Councilor Murphy about smaller departments. I've seen us have hearings on smaller departments. And sometimes it's really good to have them come in because you can hear if they are going to have to take an employee and go half time with that employee or not, but just to have them here is very valuable sometimes to hear about that small department. So I just wanted you to let you know that, Councilor Murphy. Yeah. Um, Councilor Casey. I'd be willing on either one of those dates. Okay. So let's see if you can uh, get it for Your Honor, did you have? I just I didn't hear the date, so um, June 11th and 12th. June 11th and 12th. And 12th. Okay. For what? So the only two dates that are open where their meeting room hasn't been scheduled, or there isn't another committee meeting of some kind. It does give for really a lot of time. to have 14 days. Mm -hmm. for, uh, what is that going to be? Well, this would be would be budget hearings. They wouldn't have to be advertised. Right. You uh, have like two budget. more days. One, 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 no, one, I'm just saying days. those dates are available. Right. Councilor Schwartz and Councilor Specter express. Their opinion, can't, whether they want to do I just have regrets. Can't do this. I can't. I no, it's fine. Um, you can't check your calendar phone today. I'm just going to pass that. I'd be happy. I'm not going to try to get it. Okay. I mean, I'll try to come. I, I can't check because I don't have anything with me. So. Why don't we do this? Okay, so there's two, there's two things to consider here. Is can we get the other departments? Okay. Here, well, we'll find that out. We'll find that out. All of you on a certain day, right. most of you on a certain well, day. All right. Well, let's say we'll get. We're going to shoot for a quorum for the 11th and 12th. What are the departments you want to hear from? The only one I really want to hear from is schools. Schools. Councilor Freeman Daniels. I you want to hear from schools and libraries? Yes, please. Schools and libraries. Anyone else? I only can do. You want schools and quorums and Lily? Quorums. Council Lavard. Just the 11th. You can only do the 11th. Yeah. All right. Anyone have any? Legal. I'm sorry. Legal. 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 Yeah. Legal. All right. Uh, now, does that involve inviting these people back since we're having another meeting? Uh, because it's not their graduation anymore. It's not their graduation. <laughs> yeah. Why wouldn't it? Yeah. If you're having another hearing, you're not going to invite them back. What time would this meeting be on the 11th? Okay. Wait. Hank. Uh, what? Council Lavard. Yeah. 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 Since Council, you can only do the 11th, right? Exactly. If, if I can make it, what time would this meeting be on the 11th? What are we talking about again? The five again. Five yeah. five. I might have to come. It's I'll come at nine while you're still going. Okay. okay. <laughs> I don't want to get through it. If the solicitor is the only non-salary employee, you want to send a memo, I guess he's going to have to charge for that too, right? And one way or another, I think. Yeah. Whatever's cheaper. I mean, yeah, yeah whatever's memo. cheaper on that one, I agree. Yeah, because the expenditure you would insist on that. We would force him to justify his expenditure if could come before us. I am hearing schools, libraries, memo from legal. Anybody Anybody else? All this is going to be done on the 11th. I'm sorry? Arts. Arts? Special yeah, plate is held for you. One and a half. Perhaps 15 minute allotments. Maybe. The one thing I might suggest don't come in for a half hour. Tell them all to be here. Right. You can be here once. You can be here once and then not have to schedule one and a half hour. Yes. Yeah, actually, you're just going. 505, 510, 511, and then. Where's the problem? Uh, actually, we're still convened here, and I like, uh, as I'm not particularly skilled at this, as we've clearly seen trying to manage a meeting.
But right now, there is a proposal on the floor to convene a meeting on the 11th or 12th. Mary will de determine which best suits the purposes of the people that we're asking. We're asking. Can we just note that the mayor and finance director cannot come on the 12th? Noted. Noted. The 11th will shoot for. It's my 20th wedding anniversary. Oh, oh. you got your priorities completely skewed. All right. That's uh, <laughs> the uh, the uh, and the list I have now. I almost hesitate in saying it because every time I say it, one gets added on. He says, looking at the LDM, the uh, we have schools, libraries, memo from legal. And arts. Music. Going on to it twice. All right. That, we'll put that under arts. All right. So is, is that's a motion. Uh, Can any, I ask? Please. The school are they yeah. being added on all of those? I'm sorry. Yes. 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 That's okay. So you're talking the 11th at five o'clock. Five o'clock. So we're going to try four and see. And and this is contingent, as Mary said on whether these departments can actually make that one prescribed time. You just, you just be mindful of that. Hopefully some from school, and at least a big enough to do. So, I was in favor of that motion, convening on the 11th. Aye. 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 I'm saying aye. I'll say aye too. Doesn't mean you have to come. Aye. Aye. Okay, aye. Yeah. Oh, that, that's <laughs> you. Aye. Right aye. Send him. Make it a nine hour. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I will. I don't know that. I will not be here at five. I will try and change at seven o'clock. So I'll try and get here. I, I think a, you'll be here after seven. Like I have a school meeting. concert. I have to go. Motion to adjourn. Second. Mercifully. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you all.